Hello, welcome to the August 16th, 2022 Club Cubase live stream. I'm going to do a quick audio test and then we will begin. Bear with me just for a moment. All right, my name is Greg Undo. I'm the host of the live stream today. If you do not attended a Club Cubase live stream, how it works is you can submit questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de or simply ask your question in the live chat field. Uh, we'll try to get through all the questions in order uh, chronologically. And uh, as we work with this, uh, realize that I will not be able to keep up in real time with the questions. So if you don't see an immediate response to your question, if you want to, if we could refrain from asking the same question repeatedly, that would be appreciated. Um, so, and when asking questions, if you could specify which version of Cubase that you're using, also um, which level. So if you have Cubase LE, AI, Elements, Artist, or Pro, if you're running version 10, 11, or 12, that information is helpful as, 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 long, as well as which uh, operating system, if you're running on Mac or PC, that information is helpful. Um, and we should have all of the topics covered in the live stream today, posted and pinned to the top with timestamps with all of the topics, so you could refer to that. But if you wanted to search for topics that have been covered in previous live streams, you could go to cubaseindex.com, and Jan from Stockholm has been kind enough to set that website up. We want to give special thanks. We have two people, that are just community members, they're not Steinberg employees, that would serve as moderators. Uh, so we have Agent K and Jazz Dude. We'll give special thanks to them. Another wonderful resource of information for Steinberg that's very valuable to the community is the Cubase Nation Discord. So you make sure you check that out, and Jazz Dude does a lot of work with that. So as I mentioned before, my name is uh, Greg Undo. I am the uh, host for the live stream. I work for Yamaha Corporation of America, which is the United States distributor for Steinberg products. Uh, and I'm based in Alexandria, Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. And if you're watching the live stream live, make sure that you go ahead and please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. And we will go ahead and begin. All right, so we have a question from the Cube. Uh, will there be new presets in new version of Cubase as well as what are the new logical editor presets in Cubase Pro 12? Just downloaded it, thanks. All right, so let's say we want to look at, there's a lot of new presets that have been created. So let's say we go to our MIDI logical editor. Uh, one of the things that you could see immediately is uh, you, there are user presets, but you could also just uh, go through a number of factory presets. So we could just get an, a sense for all of the different presets that are available. So there are kind of a lot of new presets that were made available. Uh, and if you wanted to create user presets, you could also exchange them much easier just by clicking when we go to the preset area. Then you go to the bottom, you could click on show user presets folder. And at this point, it could just take you directly to your logical editor presets. All right, so we have a, you see a question. Uh, hi, Greg, I'm having recurring issues and hard crashes pertaining to NVIDIA graphics drivers in Cubase 11 Pro. I'm just wondering if Cubase 12 addresses any of these issues. Uh, so I think a lot of it would be um, similar uh, between the two different programs. So, you know, I think that uh, if you have kind of a bad graphics driver and sometimes rolling back or just kind of rolling, uh, I think NVIDIA actually has a DAW mode, like a DAW mode uh, that you could use as a preset. But, you know, a lot of times all the advanced gaming features. Uh, so if you have the option of just dealing with um, you know, a more basic uh, set that often will give you better compatibility. 
So, and if you don't necessarily need all of the gaming features, you could utilize that. And if you wanted to test to see how it worked in Cubase 12 versus Cubase 11, you could always download the trial version and give that a shot. Um, so we see Jazz Dudes just mentioned he's running Cubase 12 with the NVIDIA uh, 11650 Ti without any issues. All right, and we see uh Jan from Stockholm for cubaseindex.com on the live stream as well as John Costigan from Kenosha Wisconsin and we have Benny checking in from Sweden glad you can make it and also Stefan from Sweden all right Robbie Bowling from Dallas uh all right and we have Daniel checking in from Munich okay I guess Jazz Dude's a video card now that I read it out is a GTX 1650 Ti all right, so we have Chris Hallam is now in has relocated from Columbia, South Carolina to Athens, Georgia. Glad you can make it, Chris, to our live stream today. All right, and great to see Nick from the UK on. Okay, Nick says we have 40 people watching and only 18 likes, so he wants people to whack the like button. All right. All right, and we have uh, Quatrain Entertainment from Quatrain Space City. So thanks for joining us today. We had artists known as Love checking in from New York. All right, so we have uh, just a question. Uh, hey, Greg, just a quick reminder about the warp tool with musical events follow difference. Uh, still don't understand. Thanks. All right, so we'll go ahead and do that ahead of my list. For later, but let's go ahead and take care of it right now. Okay, so the question that we had, and this is kind of carryover from last week, was uh, what's the difference between uh, our warp tool and warp grid and warp grid with musical events? All right, so let's say I have uh, a MIDI part right here that's set to musical time base and we have audio events here. So you can see it probably more clearly with the MIDI data, but let's go ahead and uh, so we have our audio loop here. So we'll just go ahead and listen to it. All right, so what I want to do is first, we have our audio events set to musical mode, as well as our MIDI, the track is set to musical mode and our MIDI track is set to musical mode. So now when we go to warp grid and I move my measures, we can see that the audio is gonna play back kind of at the same speed and the MIDI, as the tempo is adjusted here, So my MIDI is playing kind of at the same exact speed. We see that the audio has sped up and slowed down. But now when we switch this mode to warp grid with uh, musical mode, uh, with musical events follow, now as I adjust both the MIDI and audio will just stretch to play back at the new tempo like so. So now when I change the tempo, both the audio and MIDI will speed up and slow down and match whatever designations we made from the warp editing. But if I just put this into standard warp, we can see that the MIDI is going to be the same. The audio will change uh, the speed to match the tempo changes. So now we could just have both events automatically automatically just follow the warping uh, when it's done with the warping tool follows with the uh, musical events follow mode activated. So let me know if that helps. All right. Okay, so we see a question from uh, Greg Busby or 
Busby. Um, my stereo template uh, VST plugin manager shows 21 instances of mix convert V6, but the plugin info screen at the bottom does not list where any of those instances are. How do I close these? Okay, so let's see if I create, uh, I will just create a surround output bus here. So I'm gonna to go to my studio menu and we'll go to the audio connections. And I'm gonna create just a 5-1 bus. Okay, and I'll make this my main mix bus here. So now if I go to these particular audio events, let's say if I have my stereo track, um, Okay, so as we come over here, let's take a look at All right, so sorry my chat field just All right, so it could be that um All right, so let's see if we have any instances when I go to my VST plugin manager here. All right, so I think now that I have like these tracks going to, uh, you know, it's gonna be perhaps part of the panner here. So let's say if I switch these particular tracks and let's say if I switch this from a 5-1 out to a stereo, All right, so let's see if. And it might be kind of showing up, um, you know, in the control room as well. So let's say if we come to our down mix preset, so it may be showing up there, but I think it could be. Uh, if you can let me know if you have uh, how many channels that you have surround panning on. So let's say if I now will come over here and go to our audio connections. And let's say if I get rid of this particular bus. And we'll make this our... And out, we'll see if that affects your. So it still shows six. And let's see if I do a new project. So it could be maybe if you're doing surround sound or if you're utilizing the control room. So let's see if I turn off the control room.
So I know it's often used for the down mix presets, but if you could let us know, and I'll just check here again, if we have it. Yeah, so it could be a, a number of them are added in the control room. So when I activate the control room, we'll see that for each of the different effects. So when I come over to the control room, and this could be like utilizing the down mix presets here, it uses the mix convert functionality. So let's say if we go directly to our um, or VST plugin manager. We'll see now that it's this has been act the control rooms have been activated. If we now go to our mix convert. That will see six. So I think that's going to be used in the control room. But if you have uh like outputs that are going to surround, I think it might get loaded as part of the surround panner so that you could do down mixing. I see that it says your stereo template, but maybe you have, um, you know, groups that are set up in quad or something like that as well. All right, uh, so we have a question. Uh, having a bit of trouble getting the vocals softer. It's a bit too hard and straight on, so to speak. Uh, do you have any tips on what I can do? Uh, Cubase 12 Pro, Windows 10. Um, so if you have vocals are too soft, you know, I mean, compression is always a good thing, uh, rolling off, you know, if you can't get them softer, uh, let me just open up something with vocals so we can take a look at some softening. And one that you might want to use and check out, we'll try it on this. I'm not sure if it'll work. I haven't tried it in this case, but maybe an envelope shaper. So let's say we have. What did you say? You wished so I want to make these vocals softer. So, you know, maybe the first thing I might do is just subtract a EQ. off a lot of high end let's say if you want kind of that presence but still softer hoping for but um but you know try just also just a you know standard compressor so let's say if i just wanted to go directly to dynamics and go to the compressor here so without that And then you could kind of make it softer there. And without that. So I would try just like some simple EQ and compression and think of subtractive EQ. And I think that you can kind of make your your vocals softer that way. Let me know if you've tried that. All right. All right. And we have Joshua checking in from Leeds, Yorkshire. Thanks for joining and being a part of the live stream this afternoon. 
All right. Uh, hello, Greg. I've tried uh, the very audio scale assistant, but the track that I duplicate says linked to the original. Uh, any changes that I make are applied to both tracks. Have I missed a step? All right. So if we are here and let's say if we duplicated a particular track, so I duplicate this vocal track, it's still playing back the same exact audio file. It's referencing the same file. So if you make an edit on one, it's going to if I make very audio edits on this particular track, it's going to apply it to the other track because it's, you know, referencing the same audio file. So to get rid of that, what I would do is select the one maybe that you've duplicated, go to your audio menu and come right over here. And we will just say bounce selection. You'll be asked if you want to replace events, say yes. And now when you do this, this is a separate newly created audio file that's different than your original file. Otherwise, when you duplicate a track, it's going to basically just, um, you know, do the edits to the same audio file and that same audio file is being used twice. So try duplicating it and then render a new file either with a bounce selection or render in place. And then you have a separate file that can be edited differently. All right, so we have Spike Williams checking in from Wales and Brian Sawyer from Beulahville, North Carolina. All right, so we see that the audio warp modes were clearer this time. All right. <clears throat> All right, so we have a question. Uh, can I select MIDI data by velocity on the MIDI editor? So if you, let's say we have a number of MIDI events here, let's say in our piano. All right, so let's say if I select a particular note, we could say, okay, this velocity of this note is 98. So using the logical editor, we can just come right over here and do a setup. So we could say we want to select notes uh, or we could just say value two and we could say that are less than 100 so what this will do is select every note that has a velocity less than 100 and leave the other notes completely intact or we could say select uh, every note that is bigger or equal to 100 so every velocity that's louder than 100 we could select. So we could just kind of use these as different logical editor uh, presets that you could call up. And if you know, if you do this frequently, you could just save those as presets and call it up with a user defined keyboard shortcut. So let me know if that helps. Okay, so we see John Koskin just saying thanks for clearing up the warp modes. He needed that, all right. And we have Soren checking in from Sweden. Uh, so we see just interesting. Uh, is it possible, question, to mix and produce uh, use only using only the stock Cubase plugins? What about the quality of stock Cubase plugins, Greg? Uh, I'm sure they're, uh, that with the stock plugins, Cubase are more stable. So you could definitely do entire projects with stock plugins. Lots of people do it. Uh, we see a lot of people that had relied on third-party plugin tools, you know, over time just kind of migrate to using the built-in Steinberg ones. And you realize that Steinberg has been doing audio plugins since, you know, 1994. So we've been doing it for a long time. You know, we don't necessarily, we kind of, instead of necessarily trying to offer it as an add-on sale for additional revenue, what we try to do is just to give more of a value in the Cubase product, the included Cubase product tools. So you could definitely do wonderful work. Um, like I don't really see the, I don't, when I'm doing a lot of projects, I you know can get by without third-party plugins just for the most part. So, and I think there's lots of people who will will kind of indicate the same things. All 
All right, so we have a question. Uh, hi, Greg, from Montenegro. This is from Balsa. Thanks for joining us. Uh, is there a way to see time information of the range selection tool, length selection? It shows bars and beats, but can it show seconds? So yeah, it just depends on what you're currently set as your master time format. So let's say if I want to come over here and I do a range selection, we can see my range uh, start and end and the range length. If I just switch my master time to seconds, we can now see that the range selection is represented in seconds. So our, our start and end position is now set to seconds. Uh, or if we want to see it in simpty time code frames, samples. So it really is whatever your master time format is set to. That is how the uh, data will be reflected. If you have a primary and secondary time display, you may by default see just a primary time display here uh, in the transport. And if we just take these three little dots and extend that over to the right. And we could choose this as seconds. If we hit the period key uh, just above the space bar and to the right on a US keyboard, I think it's the same. But that way we could toggle back and forth between our primary and secondary time display. So if I quickly wanted to see that in bars and beats, or quickly see it in actual time in seconds and milliseconds. You could just hit the period key on your computer keyboard, uh, not on a numeric keypad, but just above and prob probably to the right of the space bar. And then you could quickly toggle back and forth between those two views. So let me know if that works. All right, so I just see question, uh, how can I play back to my mixer or to my keyboard? Um, so I'm not sure if you want to, uh, if, if you want to send the audio in MIDI to your mixer or keyboard. So if you want it, if you have a mixer, what you could do is connect the output of the audio interface. Um, so that's been defined let's say either in your control room, like I have my control room set up here to go out of outputs one and two, I could connect that to a mixer. And if it was a MIDI track, I could send this out to any MIDI device on that's installed on my computer. Um, so that's how you could uh, play back to a mixer. So you need to physically take probably the audio outputs, um, you know, from your audio interface into the mixer. And if you have a MIDI track, you could take that and wherever the keyboard is set up MIDI-wise, whether it's a USB port or if it's connected to an audio interface or to a MIDI interface, we could set and say, okay, this is going out of my, you know, I have my Steinberg UR, UR24C MIDI output and I could set that and have that go into the keyboard. The keyboard will then generate sounds, and then we could have the audio outputs of the keyboard being sent to the mixer. So, okay, so we see a uh, question. I'm having to start Cubase 12 twice now to get my SSL plugins to load on Mac M1. The first time Cubase starts, uh, it says Apple Silicon. For the plugins to work, uh, it has to say Rosetta 2. So it's probably that they're not VST3 plugins. Uh, so, and that's why to utilize them, if they're not VST3 plugins, that you have to run them in Rosetta mode. So you could contact SSL and make sure that you have the latest versions, but when we go, if you always wanted the program to open in Rosetta mode, if we come over here to the applications and let's say we select Cubase 12, right click and then choose get info, we could choose uh, whether to, if you go to uh, more info, we could say, you know, open 
Um, you can say it right here, uh, open using Rosetta or open using Apple Silicon. So uh, contact SSL and see if they're going to have M1 native plugins and that they're VST3. So that's uh, so it's not necessarily a Cubase issue, but uh, third-party plugins. So check them. I see a comment from Jazz Dude saying that the uh, Cubase stock plugins are uh, totally underrated. So I think it's a fair statement. All right, so we see uh, my template contains only stereo and mono tracks. Uh, VST plugin manager shows 21 instances of mix convert V6. How do I close those? Um, so, you know, check if you wanted to email me uh, your template, I'd be happy to look at it because uh, a lot of times it's maybe loaded in conjunction with another uh, particular function. Uh, but make sure like every single group, every single effect send uh, all, you know, or if you're doing anything with Atmos stuff, you know, it says, I know you indicate that you're only doing stereo mono, but if you want to email me a link, to your template, I'd be happy to take a look at it. All right, so a question from Spike Williams. Uh, is there a way to transpose the chord track to a different key? Okay, so let's say if I'm here and we have my chord track here, I'm going to just shift and double click on the first chord event to select all of them. So when we see our root key indicated here in the info line, all we have to do is I'm just gonna click and say, okay, now I want this all to be in D or E major, F minor. So we could just kind of come right over here and change your key accordingly. So do it from the info line. Let me know if that makes sense for you, Spike. All right, so we see a question. Um, how do I remove a plugin that is showing up twice in the list? It only needs to show once, correct? Um, all right, so it could be, so I guess if it's in, like when we go to plugins and we see our plugins here, so it could be that, um, like you may have a VST3. So if you see a plugin listed twice, it may be a VST3 and a VST2 version. You could see if we see these three slashes to the right of the plugin name, that indicates that it's a VST3 version. Uh, but it could be often that, you know, if, it, if you have multiple plugins installed, but what you could do is go to your studio menu and let's go to the VST plugin manager and once we see kind of our default settings here, and if you see the, the plugin listed twice, you could just come uh, right here and choose to, you know, you could duplicate this collection. So we'll say we're going to, uh, Okay, so we're gonna copy the current collection and then you, when you see this, you could just say, oh, uh, let's just delete that plugin. So we could delete the doubles, but it could be that you have uh, VST2 and VST3 plugins uh, installed, you know, VST2 and VST3 versions of the same plugin installed. All right, uh, so I just see, uh, did you get a chance to, question, did you get a chance to check the SKI remote for M1 Mac? It disappears every time I start Cubase 12. Um, so let me just see, I think I installed it, but I may not have tested it, but let's see. Um, So 
So um, I, I haven't tested it, but I, I, you know, last week I just got my new M1 Mac, so I haven't tested it with the iPad yet. Um, but I, you know, next time when I start Cubase, probably, you know, if we have an issue and if I restart, I'll, I'll check it out here. Um, but it, you know, it seemed like everything installed fine, but if you want to send me uh, an email to club Cubase at Steinberg.de, I'd be happy to kind of, uh, to, to test it and see if it shows up consistently. So see from Hugo Stiggs uh, says, I really don't know why anybody uses anything else but Cubase. Cubase is hands down a superior DAW. So. All right. So we have uh, from Soren, uh, can I see the latency from plugins that I have in the inserts in control room? Okay. So when we look at our plugin chain, let's say if we want it to look at our plugins and I'm going to activate the control room. And then activate the channel latency there. Okay. So as we add plugins, I'll just Just add one with a lot of latency on it. So I don't think that we will see the latency indication on the control room uh, for the plugins. Um, but if you wanted to know what the plugins latency is, so I may not be showed there, it'll show in the channels. Uh, if you drop the same plugin on a particular track, um, at that point you could see how much latency each plugin is. And I believe if we also go into our VST plugin manager, so let's take a look at Pitch correct. And let's go to information. So if you wanted to, like as we would click on different plugins here with the information enabled, you could also see what the latency of each plugin is directly there, and that's in samples. So it may not show it directly in uh, the the control room, but you could you know determine the latency of the plugins, and you know either by dropping on a track or looking in the VST plugin manager and in info. All right, so we have Mike Rivera checking in from San Antonio. Thanks for being on the live stream today. All right, uh, question. Uh, hey, Greg, is it possible to put some insert effects and then add to them a saved effects chain by loading a preset or load two presets to form a chain? Um, so I think that once you have a, uh, once you have effects on a particular track, that if you load a track preset, it may uh, overwrite those particular effects. But let's see if we could maybe copy it to another track. So let's say I have a couple of inserts here, okay? And let's say I have no inserts on this track. So I'm gonna come over to let's say a preset. All right, so I'm gonna drag this track preset over to channel two, so we have that. Um, all right, so when we go to look at our inserts here, let's see if we could drag these over somehow. So 
So it looks like you may have to kind of drag them over uh, one plugin at a time. So let's say if I just drag, but I don't know of a way to kind of merge uh, multiple uh, multiple plugins from track presets, you know, the track presets will, uh, and it could probably be more problematic, you know, if people dragged them and thought they're doing a track preset and then, you know, people just kept adding inserts to it. So I, but, uh, it looks like you can copy, you know, plugins from one particular track to another individually, but I don't know of a way to do multiple, uh, multiple inserts without replacing the existing ones, but I could play around with it some more. All right. Lovely to have Tim Weinheimer from Mission Viejo. And just wishing everyone well. So I think I saw your pictures on Facebook of seeing psychedelic furs. It sounds like a fun show. One of my friends who's uh, often been on the live streams, I think was involved with them back in the day, Ed Buller. All right, we see Sable Winters on the live stream. Thanks for being here, Sable. All right, we have Tata Digital Studios sending greetings from Finland. Thanks for being here. All right, uh, so we have a question from Ted Springman. Uh, what is the best way to copy all the subtle pitch inflections of one singer's performance and apply it to another singer's version of the same material? Um, so there isn't really a good way of doing that because each, you know, because if we copied the settings over exactly, um, you know, because you're, let's say, a singer, if you have, uh, so let's say you have two singers and obviously their pitch isn't going to be identical. So as we are working on vocals, you know, so there isn't a way to necessarily copy the very audio settings from one to the other with all the different inflections. So you might have to kind of do that manually. And if we did copy it, you know, if their notes were subtly different in time or was a scent off those things wouldn't translate over so there isn't necessarily a uh, kind of way of you know doing those little subtle inflections you could you know have it automatically quantized to you know the particular events but you know there isn't like a copy in f there i don't know of a, an easy way to you know other than manually doing it of copying you know, those subtle inflections uh, from one part, from one vocalist to another part. All right. So we see from Spike Williams just saying, thanks, Greg. I just couldn't work it out. That makes perfect sense. Easy when you know how. Thanks again. So glad it helped. All right, um, so we have a question from Sable Winters. Uh, on the topic of VST3 versus VST2 instruments, I formerly recorded a track instrument as a VST2, but same is also VST3 will not let me replace a track with VST3 version, scan list it, but cannot select it. Um, so if it's an instrument track, so let me... Say we have an instrument track here, and let's say, okay, so let's say we have like an electric piano as an instrument track here. And I wanted to replace that. Um, you may just be best to come over here and just say, okay, I wanted to this to play back in the grand. All right, and I'll load up just a quick Model D piano. So at this point, I could just, you know, copy this particular event over and now.
because if it was added as an instrument track, it's going to be associated with that particular instrument, but you could just load it up, copy the data down. And then if, when you remove the track, then at that point it, that, you know, the other plugin version, if it was a VST two won't be there. So let me know if that's helpful and what you want to accomplish Sable. All right, uh, so you see, uh, hi Greg from Rochester, New York. Uh, um, is there a way to rename a cycle marker to selected events name using a keyboard shortcut or macro or logical editor? All right, so let's say we'll just call this um, ePiano. So I, let me just add a cycle marker. Move my marker track down. All right, so let's add our cycle marker. So I'm just gonna hit P. Okay, so now we can see our name. So let's see if, um, so let's see if we have um, both events. Let's see if we could do it through a lot, a project logical editor. I don't think we can, but we'll give it a quick try. All right, so let's see if we could do if the edit rename. All right, so let's see if we can figure this out. So let's say, okay, we wanna take, so there's not in kind of an automatic way of doing it. Um, but one of the things you could do, there is kind of a um, edit and name marker key command. So let's come over here. All right, so let's maybe take a different approach. Let's see if we go to
I just probably really long shot. So what I'm hoping to do is to take uh, the name of this particular event, copy it. We'll say go to marker and generate the name. We'll see what happens and then try to paste the name. Yes, I don't know of a, a quick way of doing it, but there is a, a keyboard shortcut for, I mean, I, uh, I think it's insert and name cycle markers. So once we have this set up, you know, just selecting it. Yeah, so, but there are some keyboard shortcuts, but nothing kind of automatic, Joe, but I, I could play around with it and see if I could dig into more project logical editors, take some different approach. Sorry about that. Um, all right, so we see from uh, Tata Digital Studios, uh, please sir, help me understand more on how to master a song in Cubase Elements. So a lot of times when you have uh, like, let's say a two track song and you know, we're, you know, we've mixed it down and we want to do some different processes on it. So let's say, I think I have a two track. All right, let me just open. Okay, so, you know, often it's going to be like, you know, subtle, like, you know, a bit of EQ. And so if we have our track here, um, let's just say, okay, I want to take this track. And just even processing it. So, you know, if I wanted to say, okay, we wanted to roll some low end off. And you know, maybe some spot EQ. And even if you go into the channel strip and say, okay, I wanted to run, I, I think that some of these are inside of Cubase elements, but say, okay, let's just run a limiter. like saturation. So if we just kind of turn these on, You know, you could do some different processing. So, 
So, you know, try just some uh, simple limiting and processing, you know, but, you know, there could be, there's a whole art form of mastering, but, you know, I would start with like compression or doing uh, some, some basic uh, dynamics and EQ, and that should take you a long time. All right, so we have uh, RJ from Franklin, Tennessee. Thanks for joining our live stream. Been to Franklin many times. Great, my chat field just jumped on me, so. I see Nexus wants everyone to hit the like button. All right. All right, so we see uh, from Ted Springman says, uh, hi, Greg, sorry if I missed your answer from Friday, but how do you use a project template so you don't accidentally send audio to template audio folder? So when you make your template, um, so you know the first thing to do is when you make your template, so let's say, okay, I've come over here and you know, I'm building up I have a number of virtual instruments, number of audio channels. And my audio is all routed. So let me just add some instruments. And groups. So everything is kind of set up in my template. So when you are actually working on your template, make sure that one, you don't have any audio files. So what I would do is just go to your pool window and say, okay, we want to, um, you know, take these files and we can move them into the trash. So we could just say, okay. Um, and then if you wanted to empty the trash you could do that but it's always good to start off with no files in no audio files in your template because if you start off with audio files in your template at that point it's um you know those files will always be a part of your template and it's you know generally you're kind of starting from a fresh uh like you know an unused unblemished palette to start with so make sure that your template doesn't have audio files in it. Uh, sometimes, you know, make sure that one, you actually come over here and choose to not start from a project, but save as a template. So when I come here, we'll just call this Ted as my template. Okay, so we hit okay, and we've now stored our template. So if I do a new project, uh, I would click under more and then we would see uh, the template there. Now at this point, you wanna make sure like, and since Cubase or Nuendo 11, it'll prompt you at this stage, and this is a critical thing, prompt for the project location. So when you hit uh, create, it's gonna ask you to create a new folder. So we want to create a new folder for every project. At this point, we'll say new folder, Ted masterpiece. So all of the files are going to be going into this newly created folder. And then now when you start off, you'll be all set with no audio files resident within the template. So make sure one that you uh, get rid of all the audio files in your template before creating the template Two that you actually choose save as template. And then when we go to new project, choose your template and make sure that prompt for project location is selected. And then for every new project, it's great housekeeping and great file management to have a unique folder for each project. So give that a try, Ted, let us know how it works out. All right, so we see from uh, Sable Winters says uh, Pro 11, formerly an Elements 9.5 project. So I guess it's probably with copying the data over. So, you know, just 
you know, if it's going from a VM. using this piano so and you know you're using the grand so when we do the grand at that point we want it to uh, automatically load up the grand and if it sees it it doesn't see the vst2 version it could load up the vst3 version some plugins don't work that way uh, and can't make that association between the vst2 and vst3 uh, it's really how the plugin was developed so, but if you don't, uh, if it's, if that's the case, just try to add the new instrument and then just manually copy it over. All right. Wonderful to see Michael teams from Weatherford, Texas. So I think virtual ice cream is going to commence. All right. All right, so we see, uh, hi Greg, what is the best way for efficient gain staging in Cubase 12? Um, all right, so you know, make sure that when you record audio that it's gonna be recorded at you know, a good level. So you, know, you always want to have kind of you know, the level coming in, not too hot, not too low, so that you don't have to do things to uh, to affect the gain stage. So make sure that, you know, a lot of people aim for minus 12 or minus six DB when recording audio. So make sure that that's kind of a good place to, to set, you know, so you don't want to, the basic concept is you don't want to have a bad gain choice have to be corrected later down the road. So if all the gain structures is pretty consistent and you know you record in at a good gain level you don't have to make up for it later through plugins or through you know adding a lot of gain and volume which could add to noise so just you know make sure that a you're starting off with a good signal in and then that you're not altering it and you're like you're not taking it down and then taking it up unnecessarily so but it's kind of just standard gain structure and the same principles that apply for analog processing would be um, just set, uh, would be set, you know, for and be very applicable for Cubase as well. <clears throat> All right, so we see question, why is my, from PZ136, uh, why is my Cubase background transparent? So I'm not sure if it is uh, this background here, like the edit background or the event background, if it's the event background that you're talking of, if we go to uh, event display, and I think if we go to uh, we could adjust the opacity here. So let's say if we Sorry, we'll do the event opacity. That we could see that the events here, as we look at them, will be kind of more, you know, like as we move. So check if it's for the event or if it's the background. So now every event that I have here, the opacity will be, you know, it'll be, it'll appear to be transparent. So again, go to preferences, event display, and then you could always just kind of set this to defaults, hit apply, and then you should see that. But if we adjust the opacity settings for the event and we hit apply, we can see that that will become transparent, which some people like so that they could edit on the grid. So let me know if that's what you're talking about. All right, so we have uh, Jack Shot Records, uh, just checking in, sending greetings from Canada. And you don't have to apologize for being late. He's editing a track today, so this is way more fun. All 
All right, and we see Jazz Dude just saying, uh, can be transparent or <clears throat> even uh, with its own desktop, change the menu under window. Maybe it's under windows, rather, sorry. <clears throat> All right. And we see the virtual ice cream distribution has begun from Michael Teams. All right, and we see Gerald Ely from Martinez, California. Thanks for being a part of the live stream today. All right, and we have Soren checking in from Munich. And he's just indicating that Oktoberfest starts again this year. The big smile, it looks like. All right, we have Madge Deepers checking in from a cloudy United Kingdom. Uh, so we just see a question. Uh, Hi there. Is uh, today only Q&A or comes later and how to make club music or is club meaning Cubase owner? So when you say the club Cubase, it's not, uh, you know, specifically a club Cubase, but a collective of people just kind of getting together uh, and we answer questions for them. Sorry for the confusion on that. All right, uh, so we see, hi, I'm new to Cubase, uh, so sorry if it's a dumb question, but I would like to know if there's a way to drag and drop samples from the grid to the media browser. So, you know, generally there's not much of a need to do, you know, samples from the grid to the browser. Any, the browser indicates everything that is already, you know, if you have an audio file in your project, it's automatically going to be reflected in the browser or the pool window. So we don't necessarily have to drag because the browser could be updating all the time. Generally, most people will take, you know, events from. You know, we'll want to take events from the browser into the timeline. But since all of the events are already you know, available in the browser as soon as you record them, then it's not as necessary to drag back and forth. But if there's a specific reason you need to drag from the timeline or the grid to the browser, let me know. But it's already kind of reflecting uh, what you've recorded. All right, so we see, um, uh, is there a source to download useful presets for a logical editor from the internet? So, you know, there's, I think you could see a lot of it on people maybe sharing some on the, uh, on the Steinberg forums. I'm sure that there's a lot in the Discord. Uh, I've shared all of my, you know, all of my logical editor presets that I've created, that I've used in uh, different live streams with people. So if you want to email me, Soren, uh, at uh, clubcubase at steinberg.de, I'd be happy to share my uh, my presets with you as well. But there's probably a lot if you check out the Cubase Nation Discord. All right, and we just see from uh, Douglas Emerson, uh, my question scrolled off chat. You know, sometimes they will, um, you know, we've heard from people, I think Benny, this has happened to him a number of times from uh, Sweden where it's just all of a sudden he types a question and it doesn't show up on the chat. But we see this, so maybe if it was beyond 200 characters, maybe it scrolled off with that. Uh, but if you want to ask your question again, I'm sure we'll have time to get to it. And we see Nick just saying uh, sometimes YouTube eats the questions. So we see Ted Springman just says, shame on me for missing any of Greg's lectures. So you realize that, you know, you probably have a lot of things to do and busy. So.
All right, so we see a uh, question. How do you reverse an audio clip without sampler track? So really all you have to do is select, go to your audio, and we can say processes and reverse. And now we'll have our drum loop. Let me listen to it. So, well, our original loop. And then if we undo our undo. So once again, just go to audio, to processes, reverse. And that's all you have to do to do that. All right, and next question, is there a key command? So you can set a key command. So let's come over to uh, our edit menu and go to key commands and you'll see under, I think it's process audio processes or process audio. Okay, so just look under process and then you'll see reverse and you could set your own key command right there to just reverse the audio without having to utilize the sample sampler track. Michael Teams is on fire with ice cream distribution. I see Match Deepers has gotten one gallon of Dutch chocolate ice cream. That's good. My chat field just jumped on me, so let me just jump back to where I was. All right, so wonderful to see Kerwin Young, <clears throat> who's uh, back in Atlanta from a lengthy stay in Chautauqua, New York. So hope you weren't at this Alan Rushdie event last Friday or last week. Um, okay, so we see from Soren Schmidt, uh, what's the matter at the moment? So, sorry, I don't have any context for that. Okay, so Michael Teams wants people to whack that like button so that I could be gainfully employed. That's a good thing. So I have many more years until my son's in college. So, but we're glad to see you back, Kerwin. Seems like everyone else is too. All right, so we have Uno Memento checking in from Finland, just got back from the road. All right, so we have a question. Um, how do you map a VST instrument single notes, uh, not patterns mapped to chord pads? I only get VST instrument patterns mapped with chord pads, please help. Okay, so let's say I have um, just like a Rhodes patch here and I'll activate this project. All right, and now I want to go to the chord pads. And as we go to the chord pads, I'm going to um, let's just come over here. We'll turn it on. All right, so, so we're now playing block chords when I play these particular keys. So my transposition is off of my keyboard here, so. All right, so if it's playing patterns, uh, let's go to the edit. Uh, so we see this little edit key, and when we get a 
to player modes uh, instead of patterns. So we could just say, I want uh, my default piano. I just want to set this to playing chords. And then that should be able to play. Um, so it says uh, single notes not playing, not patterns mapped to my chord pads. I only get VST instruments patterns mapped. So let me know if that's kind of what you want to accomplish as opposed to just kind of triggering. So if we have this set to patterns, and let's say now when we play this, I think you now. So again, switch that player mode to playing chords. Close that and now. So let me know if that is what you wanted to accomplish. All right, so we have uh, Musique All Day checking in from Ypsilanti, Michigan. Thanks for joining us. All right, and we have uh, Fender Schender checking in from Vienna, Austria. Thanks for being a part of the live stream today. Okay, so we see from uh, Sable Winters. Uh, thanks, Greg. I'll do the copy and paste uh, track. We'll do a fresh one using the VST3 version. Uh, it's Neo Soul Keys. It's Steinberg once sold. Has both VST two and three. Yeah. So I think you know with Neo Soul Keys, I think you know what you know because that was like kind of a standalone instrument, but it's also now uh, as a sound set inside of Howling and Sonic SE. So some of that it may have changed depending on what version you're doing it. If you're doing it as a Neo Soul Keys player that was using kind of Howian in the background versus the Howian Sonic SE3 version with the Neo Soul Keys sound set loaded. So, but if you just copy, I think you'll be all set and it's a great library. Wonderful Rode, Rhodes Pianos. Okay, so we have a question from Mark Slater. It says, I have Cubase 12 elements. How do I change the key note off my loop? Say I have a synth in a minor. How would I change it to uh, C minor? Um, okay, so if we have an audio loop, let me just find one. Okay, so if we are here, um, so how do I change uh, the key note off my loops to synth and minor? How do I change it to an A minor? I guess in A minor, how do I change it to C minor? So all you'd have to do is, uh, so while we're playing this particular loop, so I'll just come here. If we select it, you can go from the info line and you'll see transpose, so. And 
then you could just kind of transpose directly there. And then, so you, you could transpose that way. It's not necessarily gonna take it from C minor to, you know, uh, A major, but you know, you could transpose up or down, so. So let me know if that works for you. All right, so we see Michael Teams is going to uh, be going up for a studio date. Michael Teams gets all the cool studio dates, all right. And he wants people to smash the like button. All right, so we see, uh, is the file browser, I like to make my own samples and move them to my folder so I can use the sample audio clips in different DAWs. Um, so it's whatever, like when you're starting a particular project, um, so we'll come over here, let's say, you know, we'll do a new project. So let's say I just wanted to uh, put this into a particular folder. I will say, let's create empty, and I will be in my projects. And let's say I'm gonna go to another folder here. So let's say Hangouts and I'll just do a new folder called Irene. And there is a preference. So if we wanted to at this point, um, like if you go to editing to audio, we can say, you know, on import audio files, uh, copy all files to the project folder. So now as I would just, you know, record files. So I just have this and I want it to record. or drop a file, a different audio file in that we can now, uh, all these, when we go to look at the particular folder, we'll go to our pool window that all these files, when we look at their location, will now be in uh, the Irene folder just right there. So that's, so once it's, uh, once you choose the folder, when you're starting a project, everything will be in that particular folder and then you could import those WAV files into any uh, any other program if you wanted to. So let me know if that makes sense for you, Irene. All right, so we have a question from Madge Deepers. Uh, I have a programmable mouse and I'm in the process of adding macros to shortcuts. Uh, I have added some workspaces and zoom options, but uh, what other time saving steps uh, can I save to buttons on my mouse? Um, so it could really like, you know, a lot of people do play, um, you know, play, stop, rewind, fast forward. I think edit, undo, redo is something that you know, a lot of people gravitate to. Uh, you know, arm tracks or maybe calling up specific tools. Um, but I would say that anything that you find yourself in your workflow, and, and everyone could have different needs, but in your particular workflow, if you find yourself going to a particular function repeatedly over and over and over again, and even if you know the keyboard shortcut, you know, just, you know, if you could access that function from your mouse, then, you know, all the better. You know, to me, it's just like the economy of motion, you know. So instead of like moving the mouse over here to go to a menu, if you know what the keyboard shortcut is for that function, you could, you know, just do the keyboard shortcut. And it's even less movement and kind of the heat of a battle of an edit to, you know, trigger a particular function with your mouse. So, 
Um, so, you know, as you find yourself like having to navigate the mouse to somewhere, if you could, you know, put that or, you know, keyboard shortcuts that maybe you're not familiar with or you wanted to use in conjunction with functions of the mouse, I would consider mapping those to uh, buttons on your mouse. And I think uh, Best Korean Jesus has done for, I think he has, a, a, if I'm not mistaken, a Logitech mouse uh, with a lot of extra buttons kind of designed for gamers. And maybe, I think he's posted a video on that, uh, probably specifically with Cubase. So you could check to uh, maybe that could give you some additional ideas of, you know, it's always good seeing how someone else would utilize something as well. All right. Um, so we see a uh, question. How do I get Cubase 12 on a Mac M1 to see all inputs and outputs from an Apollo Thunderbolt? I am able to see it a lot. I am able to see it a lot more inputs and outputs offered by the interface. Can I refresh the connections? So, you know, if you're, uh, so you're running on Mac. So when you go to your audio connections, what you probably need to do is go to your inputs. And then, you know, if we have, let's say, I'll just go ahead and remove a couple of the buses here. So Cubase may default to stereo ins and stereo outs, but really all you have to do is come over here if you say, okay, I want to add a number. Let me just undo that real quick. Just remove these. So when you go to, you know, look at the device port, you should see all of the available inputs and outputs that the operating system is accessing with Cubase. But when you go to add bus, we can say, okay, I wanted to add, you know, like 12 mono inputs. If we do this, that will automatically increment the, um, the inputs for your device. So it's probably that Cubase is seeing them all, but you may just have to add more input and output buses uh, and then once you do that, then you could assign the various inputs to all of the buses that have been created inside of Cubase. So let me know if that's the case. All right, so we see a question from uh, Music All Day. Uh, in your opinion, what's the best way to record bass guitar signal, plucking and slapping, et cetera, compress and limit, pre or post with plugins? Um, I, I'm i always a fan of, uh, and I'm a bass player, as, as probably many people know, so I try to record kind of as clean as possible. Um, and all my bass tones, what I do is I plug straight into the audio interface with no processing. Um, and I, you know, cause sometimes I don't like the sound of compression on my bass. Uh, so often what I do is I play, um, I, I try to play to the point where an engineer doesn't have to do compression for corrective purposes. And maybe if they, you know, cause there's a lot of people that do like multi-stage compression where it's like, Oh, this, this compressor is going to get this note that's popping out. And this note is too low, so I want to get another compressor for that. And I want a com third compressor to smooth everything out. And then, you know, everything starts to sound a little uh, undynamic to me. So uh, if you're doing a lot of slapping, you know, sometimes the player, you know, that could be, that could lend to, you know, notes that are, you know, a wide dynamic, unintended dynamic range that may work great for the bass player who's slapping in their room by themselves, but may not fit into the track. So I would try to record dry if at all possible, unless it's like someone is just going to, while you're tracking, if they're so inconsistent with their tracking tone that they need corrective compression on the way in. So if that's the case, if they're like very soft and then jump very loud with a slap and it's just kind of like, you know, cutting your, your head off dynamic wise, then you might do uh, compression on a way in. 
but I would try to, you know, do as little on the way in as you can because that gives you just a lot more options on the way out. But, you know, it depends on the player. I think if everything is, if it's kind of someone who is a good player, you may not have to apply compression. Uh, and then it gives you more options afterward. You know, one expression I heard uh, a friend of mine says, you know, sometimes it's hard to unburn the steak. So. All right, let's go through. Thanks for all the great questions. And if anyone has uh, learned a new tip or trick, make sure that you do hit the like button and that, and subscribe to the channel. And that enables us to continue to do uh, these live streams. Okay, so we see a uh, question. Uh, how do I switch to drum edit mode? Once I have opened the MIDI edit window to full screen mode, it appears you have to minimize to half screen to see the option again. Okay, so let me just go ahead and Activate this project. All right. So let's say I just, I have a pattern here. Okay, and I've dragged it out. All right, so now I'm in my drum edit mode says, so how do you switch to drum edit mode once I've opened the MIDI edit window to full screen? It appears you have to minimize to half screen to see the option again. So so if I'm seeing it here in you know, my, my drum edit mode, I will click on this uh, little arrow that points to the right. And then I could see everything. And then there's an arrow that points to the left, which will take you back. Um, So just make sure I'm getting this right. So how do I switch to drum edit mode once I have opened the MIDI edit window to full screen? So, all right. So maybe if we're in, let me switch. Let's say if we're in full screen key editor, And I'm going to switch to the drum editor now. So it seems like that is sticking kind of at full screen. So let me know if that's, uh, and this is from Ash Rebel Hen Studios. Let me know if I'm misunderstanding or doing something differently than you. All right, so we have uh, Beville-E saying no club rocks like this one. All right. All right, so we see uh, Douglas Emerson just uh, sharing that. Uh, Roly updated Equator 2 finally. Found it performing better, less clips, and latency. That's great. Thanks for sharing. All right, so we see a question. Uh, a client of mine has a set of MIDI files and I want to import them in one, import them in one time. How do I import all of them at the same time? So MIDI files will be imported uh, one at a time. And that's generally how most MIDI files are working or kind of complete uh, songs. But it, currently it's gonna be uh, designed where you don't 
you know, you could import multiple MIDI loops, but MIDI files will be imported like one at a time. All right, so we see Michael Teams is granted, <clears throat> excuse me, my family and myself, uh, one gallon of fresh strawberry ice cream for my family and myself. So thank you very much. It's great. All right, and we have Peter checking in from Montreal saying uh, he, he trusts that everyone's having an awesome week so far. Okay, so we have uh, from MadMac66, how can I change the project audio folder after the project has been set up, uh, either to correct a mistake or to move a project to a new location? So if you wanted to move the project to a new location, you could come over and do a backup project, and that this you would choose a new folder, and then everything could be moved to the new location. Uh, but let's say if, uh, and if you wanted to record audio to a new particular folder that you've defined, go to, uh, you could right click on multiple tracks or single track, and then there's a set record folder. And if I do it for an audio track, that would be helpful. So for audio, we can just say uh, set record folder, and then we could have everything uh, directly go to the newly defined folder. Uh, and let's say if we go to our pool window, we could set our project folder. So I think if we go to our project menu to project setup, we could uh, change the project folder location, I think here. And if you record audio in from the pool window under media, at that point you could right click and say prepare archive and that will move all the folder, all the files to the newly defined folder there. So a couple different tips. Gerald Ely saying, what a great line. It's hard to unburn the steak. Yeah. I learned that with pizza the other night for my son. So. All right. So I just see, uh, scroll up and check my question, please. Uh, Gregor Jazz did post it twice already. So I don't. I saw your comment about the Rolly. Then I see my question scrolled off chat from you. Still scrolling up. So those are the only two I see, but maybe if you just asked a question and maybe if it's too long, maybe that's what's causing it. Let me see if I could scroll back, find where we were. Those are the only one. If anyone else sees it, if they want to just copy it and ask the question again. All right, so we see it's an incredibly warm day in Montreal and that Peter and his wife will be hitting the pool so, shortly. So 
you know, take it while you can. So, all right. So we say, um, so just see, this is, uh, Follow up on the chords being triggered. Uh, thanks, Greg. It's not working. I changed in patterns to playing chord and chord pad. Still patterns only playing in that VST instrument. Uh, West African spotlight from Native Instruments. Um, so check, um, you know, check to see if you know. Sometimes when you the instrument itself may be playing back the chords or the patterns. Um, so a lot of instruments will do that in particular keys. So, you know, try to see if you get it with a different instrument or if you only get that in that behavior with that particular instrument, uh, like some instruments that are mimicking guitars, like, you know, you play a chord and instead of playing a, a block chord that you play, we'll play it like a guitar arpeggiated pattern or different guitar patterns like that. So it might be uh, part of the instrument itself. Michael Teams isn't seeing um, Douglas's question either. All right, we see Graham Witcher checking in from Royal Wooten Bassett. And where it's, so then it's raining there, so. See Mad Mac uh, 66 uh, set record folder. So much thanks. Uh, happy notes there. Thank you. Thank you. It's also a great tool if you're doing like live concert recordings. You could record to two different hard drives simultaneously. All right. We see Agent K and Jazz Dude are on top of moderation. Thank you. Okay, so we see uh, from, uh, I think we have Douglas Emerson's question. Uh, so we see uh, setup demo with external VST instrument and uh, review of latest spectral layers, uh, Cubase 12 features available. Um, so, okay, so if we have, let's take a look at working with external uh, instruments as VSTs. So if we want to do that, we go to your studio menu to audio connections. And at this point, we could choose uh, ex external instruments. And we'll say, okay, I have a montage. And what I want to do is to take the audio outputs of the montage and connect it into inputs of my audio interface. So we'll say, okay, this is going to be connected into, you know, inputs one and two, or, you know, whatever inputs are free on your audio interface. So now when I go to uh, load an instrument, because the montage, the external instrument is generating sounds outside of Cubase. Uh, so Cubase doesn't know what's going on. So what we're going to do is take the audio out of that and feed it into Cubase. This will allow us to have uh, not only uh, you know access to it, but the ability to run all of your software plugins. So when you come over here, let's go to our external plugins, and I'll select my montage. And now when I just go to uh, play, all the sounds as I play the montage, it's going to automatically route it out to the montage and the audio signal is going to come right back into Cubase. That's how we can set up for external instruments. 
Uh, and maybe the second part of the question is a review of latest spectral layers, Cubase 12 features available. So when we have, you know, particular audio, you know, some of the new things are some new ARA2 functionality that was introduced. So if, you know, to make it more simplified, because a lot of times people would, uh, you know, add different events on tracks and then they would have to manually load up the ARA2 extension to, you know, instead of going to the sample editor to go into uh, go into spectral layers or your ARA2 environment. So I'm going to select the track and we see extension. So now I could just load up spectral layers here for the track. And within just a couple seconds here, I could take this entire track. Uh, spectral layers is going to load up. Uh, and now I double click instead of going to the sample editor, we have spectral layers. Now, some of the new functionality in spectral layers nine is going to be kind of dynamic spectral editing. So as we do particular processes, um, so let's say, you know, if we come over here and start doing uh, like click repair, reverb reduction, EQ matches, that we could preview these functions to make the tweaks uh, before all the files are rendered. So that's one of the, the big, huge things because generally with spectral editing, you kind of, guess you make some changes you render the file you listen to it and then kind of continually do this process of undoing redoing tweaking enhancing uh, but now we could make those enhancements in real time while the audio plays so that we could be much faster with that particular uh, environment to work with so let me know if that's helpful for you sorry that your questions uh, weren't showing up See, Terry Gray just saying he came in at a weird moment, probably with some spam. All right, so we see uh, Douglas Emerson says, uh, he says, uh, FYI, recording now, join Spokane band Sweet Rebel D, album and tour in 23, Cubase and Gear. That's great. Congratulations. Let us know when your album is out. See, Jazz Dude just indicating uh, I really invested one year to mix 5.1 DTS in 2001. It was really something new, just trial and error. I had to find out everything myself. Yeah, those are the Wild West times for surround sound. So. All right, so you see, uh, Greg, I'm looking for a way to increase the stereo width and get more sound to the side. Uh, should I consider duplicating tracks and panning them left and right, or is there something bad about it? So there's a couple of ways you could do this. So let's say, um, I'll just do a new project here. We'll show some. So um, there's there's and, and I know Soren that you have Wave Lab, so I'll show you a technique in Wave Lab as well. So let me come over to just get add quick audio track and All right, so say I want to take this track here. Uh, 
one way to do this is just to come over to inserts and you have the imager plugin. And here what I could do is actually kind of just choose to do uh, my, my widening on particular frequencies. So if I don't want my low end to get all kind of woofy, I could just say I want to take my highs and make the highs wider. So I could do a kind of frequency dependent here. So, but if I do the lows, sometimes that could get a little unfocused. So we take this and it's just, and now we'll turn the imager on with the high and high mids. Now, Soren, I know you have WaveLab, so I'll show you a great trick in WaveLab for this. All right, so say we'll just kind of take this same track here. So in WaveLab, we could look at our waveforms in left and right, as well as mid side. So here we see the middle part of the panning spectrum, and then we have the side part of the panning spectrum. So I could just double click and select my sides. And let's just, uh, add gain, so I'm gonna add six dB of gain to the sides. And now you could just make the sides, make the mix sound wider just by editing the actual side part of the panning spectrum. So if I wanted to, if I wanted to undo that, so that's kind of where we were. And again, to process the sides, now they're selected. So those are two techniques that I would use. Sometimes kind of duplicating them may kind of lead to phase issues. So, but check that out. Let me know if that makes sense. All right, so we see, um, can you help me with my question? Resent it three times from Tab Zik Music. Um, so I don't think I've seen those questions. I did see a couple emails come in. Let me see if it's one of those real quick. But you know, generally if it's, uh, if you have the option to just ask the question. Let me see if I could. I think that this is about mapping the BST. So I haven't seen the questions, but if you wanted to ask again, you're not the only one it's happening to today. So sorry about that, but make sure when you ask that it's uh, under, I think it might have to be under 200 questions, but if I've missed it and someone else has seen it, just let me know. All right, so we see you from uh, Soren Schmidt. Uh, is there a MIDI remote script for the virus uh, TI2 already? So, you know, if you go to the, there's lots of scripts being shared. If you go and there's a whole forum uh, post dedicated, if you go to steinberg.net slash forums uh, of making your own, uh, where people are sharing uh, MIDI remote scripts. So I, I don't think it's officially supported, but there could be one that's already created for it or you know you could probably easily make one and customize it for exactly what you want it to do and you see the jazz dude's kind enough to already post a link to that all right we see michael pierce has also joined 
uh, joined the live stream after Sable was was wanting a Michael Pierce soup. So good timing, Michael Pierce. We hope you're doing well. Thanks for being with us on the live stream. He's from the UK. Okay. All right, so we see from Michael Pierce, uh, is there a quick way of resetting the values back to zero in the me loudness meter in the right-hand zone? Sorry, just blocking email just kind of came in. Uh, uh, so of uh, values back to zero in a loudness meter in the right-hand zone, it would seem to me that just clicking them would reset them, but it doesn't. All right, so let's take a look. So I think if we click right here on the reset loudness, to make sure I'm reading this right. So it's not just clicking here, but maybe on this click the reset and that will reset the loudness meter readings. So just this icon right here. So let me know if that's what you're looking for, Michael. John Kostikin is just rubbing it in that we're, before Michael Pierce joined that, we're all saying kind things behind his back. It's like, you can't tell, John. It's, it's part of the secret. All right, uh, so we see, um, hi Greg, how do I go about replacing old audio drum files to new ones in audio and MIDI at the same time? All right, so let me just open up a quick file. Okay, so let's say we have, like I wanna do a quick drum replacement. So let's say I have like drum sounds loaded on this instrument. So if I wanted to do this, I could go directly to, I'm gonna leave this, uh, this instrument track selected. I'll go to my kick drum and it's go to hit points. And I want to just edit the hit points and we'll kind of find our threshold so that we're not actually, so we can see that it's just gonna be on a kick. And then we could just say, you may see this little create icon here. Let's create MIDI notes. And I wanted to put it on to my selected track. And then we wanted to retain a dynamic velocity and I want it to be a C1 note. So now when I open up the instrument here and I'm gonna mute all of my kick drums, we're now listening to the kick from Groove Agent. And if I want to do the same on the snare. I 
again, just come here, adjust our threshold, and we'll create MIDI notes. And this time we're gonna put it uh, onto D1. So you can just simply, so go to the drum part, uh, find the hit points, kind of set the threshold so it's not catching bleed of other tracks, and then you know have a drum instrument loaded, create MIDI notes. Uh, you could create a new track, assign it to the first track. You could have dynamics from the audio or not, and choose the MIDI note, and then you should be all set with that. Okay, so we see Douglas Emerson just saying, thanks, Greg, used to call you directly in the 80s. Uh, like Stevie Wonder, I wish I had those days again. So I thought your name was familiar, so thanks for being on the live stream today. All right, um, so we have a question. How you mute a specific section of an audio without separating, splitting uh, audio? How do we do that in Cubase 12? Um, you know, so, you know, it's, if we have it all on an event, you know, we could come here and just choose to, let's say with our range tool, I'm gonna grab the range tool and then I'll hit Shift X and then all you have to do is, you know, if you, and then just click on the mute tool, you could do it like that. So, uh, you know, so I know that's gonna be splitting, but you know, otherwise it's gonna be kind of the whole event. So if you just select a range, hit shift X, and then mute that particular event, you could just do it like so. So I know that's separating and splitting audio, but I think that's a pretty fast way to do it. And you could probably create a macro to do that as well if you wanted to. See, Michael Teams is giving Michael Pierce his ice cream before it melted, so. It's very kind. Sorry, my chat field jumped on me. All right. Okay, so just see a question uh, from Daniel HH. Uh, hello, I have a question. Um, is there an optimal way to work with Cubase load as fast as possible? My projects tend to take about 10 minutes to load and I have a thread ripper and 64 gigs of RAM, thank you. Um, so, you know, it could really depend on, you know, if you're doing a lot of sample libraries um, you know, that could take a long time to load. So, you know, if, I think as, as Jazz Dude mentioned, you know, if you have 30 gigabytes of, you know, loading uh, a library, you know, from SSD into RAM, that can make a difference. Uh, also, some plugins will allow you to adjust the amount of, like, how much is being loaded into 
memory quicker. So if we wanted to, at this point, go to uh, like in Groove Agent, and we have similar thing in Halion, if you go to Options, you could set the preload, the maximum preload of value here to, you know, and that could help with that. But, you know, sometimes uh, increasing the buffer also can make some stuff load up a little faster as well. So, but, and if you're dealing with large orchestral stuff, I mean, 10 minutes sounds long even for a large orchestral session. But, you know, check all, you know, see what happens if you load up the plugin without the project without any third party plugins. It could be just one plugin that's just misbehaving that you're using a lot. So check that as well, Daniel. So. So you see Michael Pierce about the resetting uh, to zero in the loudness meter says I'm officially a fool and probably legally blind now. So my, my vision is awful as well. So don't feel bad. I'm, you know, just be happy. It's an easy solution. So. All right. So we see Madge Deepers has to take off. So thanks for joining us on the live stream. So we also see uh, just clarification from Daniel. It says, uh, I make heavy use of contact. So, you know, check to see within the plugin, like how much preload, you know, time is available. You, you know, you might be able to adjust that. I'm not a heavy contact user. And Jazz, Jazz dude just saying you uh, loads a, a Dirk alert template uh, with Jaeger library and a RAM and it's two minutes at about 50 gigabytes. So that sounds about right. And we just see kind of further clarifications it says in other programs, similar projects load in a matter of two to three minutes in Cubase, it takes about 10. So it could really depend on, you know, there's a lot of variables on how the plugin is configured, um, you know, <clears throat> and how much streaming and how many samples are actually loaded as well. So there's a lot of variables, but um, I think you'd find it to be one particular library or one, you know, one instrument in contact or, you know, see what happens if you don't load contact, but I think that will be your issue. <clears throat> All right. So we see Michael Pierce just, or John Costigan just indicating to Michael Pierce. He, is, he just learned today that the period key toggled the time display. So that's always a good shortcut. So it's a good one to memorize. It's, it's usually close to where your hands are sitting. All right. see Michael Pierce just indicating uh, it's terrible that all these lovely little features that we miss so keeps me employed so So I see uh, from Sable Winter's Shift X. So yeah, if you have uh, just a range and you want it to split, you could just do Shift X and then that will turn this into its <clears throat> own separate event. So you don't have to manually cut after. So if you just wanted to grab the range tool here, you could just, and if you wanted to drag it out, we could cut just like that. But if you want to split, the selected range, just shift plus X, and then you could just click right there. All 
All right, so we see Michael Pierce has shared his soup recipe. I know uh, it says one cream of celery. I think vegan oil and pot onions. Uh, sweat plus lemon juice, maybe sweet onions plus lemon juice, celery salt, uh, pepper and garlic, sweet high and uh, all right, high heat, cashews, parsley, water, simmer, blend, serve with olive oil and watercress. It's always sound good. Thank you for sharing your soup suggestion for the day. Yeah, so uh, so we see from Graham just saying, you know, selecting the range with the audio. So again, just shift X. And then if you just click on with the X tool, you could just mute the particular event. And that way, if you change your mind, you don't have to undo automation. You could just do it like that pretty quickly. All right, uh, so we see a question. Uh, Hi, Greg, when I export my interleaved mix from Cubase and open in, in Pro Tools, I don't get a stereo file. I see a 2A file, two monos. Is there a way to, around this when exporting interleaved? So I believe, you know, try importing the file back into Cubase uh, and see if it's a stereo interleaved file. I bet it is, and I bet that when you're importing it into other programs that it's automatically splitting it with a, a preference of some kind. So I know Cubase has a similar preference when you go to editing audio uh, on import audio files to split channels. So there's probably a similar preference that's maybe set up in your Pro Tools. Uh, so try that. Uh, but I think Cubase is exporting it right, and it's probably that the program is... Um, so I think that the, that the R program might be just splitting it, so... Michael Pierce is also saying Shift X is uh, the revelation of the day, so that's good. Okay, Terry Gray is just saying you can rejoin a stereo file by dragging it into an empty stereo track, so but it's probably just automatically splitting. And I think that a lot of programs had it have a heritage like for years that didn't do stereo audio files, even though it sounds uh, kind of ridiculous. Uh, so there's kind of uh, some, some heritage there. So, uh, but I think it's probably just going to be a preference. All right, so I think I'm at the end of questions. I know we had some questions that were mailed in, so let's go ahead and get to those. Thanks for all the great questions, and if you've learned a new tip or trick, make sure that you do hit the like button and subscribe to the Cubase YouTube channel, and that allows us to continue doing these live streams. Okay, so let me just, um, okay, so we did the first one already about the Warp Grid and Warp Grid musical follows events. <clears throat> okay, so we have a question. Uh, I'm trying to build a MIDI remote button function that allows me to show slash hide the different mixer channel strips, uh, i.e. input channels, audio channels, MIDI channels, etc. As far as I could see, I first have to actually click on the mix console with the mouse before the key commands work if it's not currently to the front slash selected. So I thought 
My workaround might be to build a macro that would first select a mix console for me and then perform the key command. Uh, just have to say, uh, I'm new to Cubase. And I've been really digging it and coming across your videos has been a lifesaver. I've been hitting the live streams though I had to miss today and even made the last couple of Zoom calls. I'm Adam with the big beard from BC, Canada. Uh, it's been super informative for me as a new Cubase user, so I just really want to say thanks. You probably don't have to do as good of a job as you're doing to make a living, but you seem to go over and ab above and are a really good educator. Props to you. Uh, so it goes on, I'm currently building a really comprehensive tablet-based MIDI remote controller full of macros and key commands to speed up my workflow and hopefully compensate for some of my lack of Cubase knowledge. So I apologize uh, for maybe over asking in this category. Um, all right, so you know the problem gets to be sometimes you know uh, what the active window is for a key command to function. So sometimes you may need to go back to the project window and make that the active window, or be in the mix console window. So to always have a setup where we could you know toggle uh, back and forth is you know could be a tricky thing. So. Um, and there's a couple of little tips for macros that we could place the state, you know, create a known state for particular objects. So let's say in my project here, I have, you know, audio instrument, a bunch of audio instrument tracks, as well as, you know, I have group channels and effects channel. So I have multiple different types. And when I go in, when I go to my mix console, at this point, I'll just say, we're going to look at all of my different events in the mix console. So if I do a key command to, you know, trigger a configuration or to hide different things, um, the mix console has to be the active window. So if this is the active window and I do a command that triggers the mix console, it may not have effect on the mix console and it may just have an effect on what is currently available based on what the active selected window is. So what we want to do is I've created a macro just to come over here. Uh, and I built it. Let's go to key command. So I have I created a macro to just uh, look at audio channels only in the mixer. So when we go to the mixer, I'm going to see uh, not only my you know input channels. I'll see all of my audio channels. And this is great if the mixer is currently open and the active window, but we, you know, if I'm here and I want to open up the mixer and see only the audio channels at that point, you know, if the, you know, if the mixer is open and we go to hit the button to open the mixer, that same key command F3 that opens the mixer closes the mixer. So if that's the active window, we run that macro then you know it may close the mixer or it may inadvertently open the mixer. So to get around this in my macro, what I did is I went to my key commands um, and I'll say, we'll say show mixer and audio channels. So what I did is I just chose to go to open the mixer so that's a known state. And then from the project window, I said, bring the project window to the front. So that switches the focus from the mixer to the project window. Uh, and then bring the focus back to the mixer. And then under the mixer here, I said, let's hide the groups, the inputs, instruments, MIDI, outputs, uh, the re effects returns, uh, and VCAs. So I'm gonna hide all of those different components here. So, and now when I go to execute that particular macro, sorry here. Okay, so when I go to execute this particular macro, what's gonna happen is, if I set this up right, so we'll go to edit, to macros and we can assign our own keyboard shortcut 
to this particular macro. So it's showed a mixer in the audio channels. And now it's gone through and opened the mixer. So whatever state we're in, you know, it'll switch the focus back to the, to the project window and then to the mixer. And then it's going to hide all those particular channels right there. So once again, just to kind of do this, and you may be able to get rid of the first step, um, but let's look at the macro one more time. So we go to key commands. So what I did to make it consistently work was, again, just devices mixer, uh, then project window bring to front, uh, mixer, and then hide the other sources. So, and if I remove this, let's see if that works, just out of curiosity. So I'm gonna remove just that step. And I'm gonna open up my mix console window and we'll show all. And let's see if I just run it while the mixer is open. If that does a trick. Yeah, so we will need to have that step first, just especially if the mixer is open. So come over here. So now even when the mix console is open and I run the macro, I think this would still do the trick. So even if the mixer is opened or closed, we can just have it go to those particular uh, scenarios like that. So let me know if that helps Adam and thanks, thank you for the kind words. And look forward to seeing you on the next Zoom meetup. I remember you live just like, you know, close to the Alaska border in British Columbia. So it was great to meet you on the Zoom meetup. Okay, so we had a question. Um, and this came, I didn't have this set up for last week's live stream with my new computer. But I got it set up this morning about how to modulate uh, any parameter. So if we wanted to do like an LFO on particular parameters that don't have like a MIDI learn function. Okay, so you'll need like a MIDI loopback device. And what I've done inside of, uh, on a Mac platform, I think that if you get a loopback, that DE, you could get it on the uh, Windows platform, but on Mac, if we come over to Applications, and you'll see under Utilities, uh, Audio MIDI Setup, this is really pretty counter, un this is pretty non-intuitive, but then you go to the uh, Show MIDI Studio, and then what you could do is click on a plus and add an IAC driver. And this is kind of like a software MIDI routing cable. Okay, so when we want to apply LFOs to different components, and what it, you know, you can think of an LFO as just kind of sending constant modulation uh, to a source. Uh, so we could start off by using the actual. Uh, we have a MIDI plugin that we could open up via a MIDI insert. So in this, I'm going to have one LFO. And let me just set these to always on top. So I have just like a really boring pad sound. And what I've done on this instrument is I said, okay, we want to send an LFO to the instruments, I'll bypass the LFO. So we're just gonna have two chords.
and I'm going to open up the instrument. So we're just going to come over to have an LFO and we could basically, you know, do a learn function and move this, but we're just going to say, okay, we're going to turn this LFO on and we'll have one that does volume and one that's going to do panning. So we go to our MIDI inserts and we'll see our auto LFO. So we're just going to have this do MIDI volume for 16th notes, dotted 16th. Or if we wanted this to be eighth notes, dotted eighth notes. And then I want it panning to be, so, you know, we're taking kind of just this, you know, maybe not so interesting of a sound. And then we're just, making it more musically, more rhythmically interesting. Now, if we wanted to do this for different components that don't reside and don't respond to MIDI, such as an audio plugin, what we want to do is to just set a MIDI track here, and we're gonna route it out through our IAC driver, or our loopback. And we're gonna go to our generic remote under Studio Setup. So what I want to do is to take this particular drum and I want it and on this drum we're going to have a filter as an insert. So this filter doesn't actually have, uh, doesn't respond to MIDI natively. So we'll just come here. So I wanted to change the position. So what we do is we're going to send create a MIDI track, and we're gonna open up the MIDI insert here for the auto LFO. All right, so that's gonna send our auto LFO on controller 10 over two measures. We go to our studio setup, and what we want to do is say, we're gonna have the input be, our, we're gonna add a generic remote, and we'll say our input we're going to set it to the IAC bus and then we could click on learn and that will capture the incoming MIDI message that was set up in the LFO plugin. So we see that it's going to be MIDI channel two controller 10. And here we want to go to the mixer. We're going to choose our glitch drums and we'll say we want to go to insert one to position. And now once we do that, that's going to be sending this LFO. So if I wanted this to be every every you know four beats or every eight beats to do this for the filter sweep, or we wanted to be half notes, we could just adjust accordingly right there. So this way we can just come right over here and have the auto LFO on a MIDI track that's routed out to the IAC bus. And I know this is kind of a workaround. And then in the generic remote, have that MIDI message coming from the IAC driver, that incoming MIDI message to control whatever parameter you want it to. So regardless of what plugin it is, if it doesn't respond to MIDI or it does, it will allow you to do LFO based effects and modulation on any particular plugin. So. All right. Uh, so we had a question mailed in. Um, I would like help on how to set up Cubase properly in a way where both myself and the vocalist can listen to the song we are working on and I can talk to her through a mic using whatever setup you recommend. And she could talk back to me using hers. Uh, I'm currently in the market for a new audio interface uh, too, so you might have a suggestion uh, which one would work best with Cubase for this. Uh, 
So, you know, any of the Steinberg interfaces would work great, but, um, and we'll give you some additional functionality, but this, what I'll show you can work with any audio interface. And what you need to do is just to have a, uh, audio interface with two mic pre's. So one of the mic pre's will be your microphone that's can, that's set up as a talk back microphone and her microphone that she's recording onto. So we would come over, let's add, let's say an audio track. And we want like a mono track for the vocal. We'll give it a name. Okay, so we'll have this for the vocal and you know, we've chosen our uh, input. So we'll say, okay, we're going into our left input, input number one. All right, now what I want to do is we'll go to your audio connections. And if you have Cubase Pro, uh, you'd need Cubase Pro. We want to add right click and you want to add a talk back microphone. And at this point, uh, we're going to say this is connected into input two. Okay, so so you, input two will be set up as the talk back microphone. Input one is the vocal microphone. Now, when you want to communicate with the artist, all you need to do is to come right over here and turn on talk back. Now, your microphone. Uh, so, what we want to do also, so we're going. That's how we could get your microphone signal. And in the control room, we want to add a headphone output to her. So we're going to go to our audio connections, and we'll add what's called a Q. So, and let's say we're going to have our Q mix. So we'd have like two audio outputs that are feeding her headphone. Now, some interfaces could have multiple headphone outputs, uh, and some you may want to have a separate output of what you're listening to in the control room and a separate output, maybe two headphone outs that's a, a different feed on the audio interface. So if you get something like a UR44C, or URRT4, something like four ins and four outs that will allow the singer to hear something differently than what you're hearing in the control room. Um, so you're going to now come over here and say the headphones are being sent on outputs, let's say three and four on this case. So now when the singer is listening, what you want to do is to you know, you could have a separate headphone mix or you could have them just simply listen to your mix that's going on. And you could enable talk back. We'll see this green button on their particular Q mix. So now when you just come over here and you say, okay, talk back is enabled. And you can say, all right, let, you hit the talk back button and you can say, okay, that, that was great. Let's try one more take. And you let go and then they're hearing themselves and they're not hearing you anymore. So we could just hold it down and let go. Or if you push it down, that will engage it. Like if you click the mouse quickly and release, that will leave it engaged. And you could just come over here and this way you can communicate through your microphone that's configured in the control room as a talkback mic to a Q mix that's sent directly from the outputs here. Uh, and then, you know, to simplify things, we could just have them listen to the mix that's in the control room. Uh, if they needed to hear a like the balance differently, we could go into the mix console and go to the racks and you'll see Q sends. So we could enable there are Q sends and we can say, okay, I want to take all these tracks and you know, we need to send and I'll just turn on quick link. And then we could say, okay, we want to take all these tracks and then we could send different levels of each track. So you say, oh, I want to hear less hand clap in my headphone mix. You could send different mix to the 
artist versus what they're hearing and to differentiate for the artist if they want to hear uh, only, they want to hear a personalized mix, you would just choose this to be on You click right here in the cues. If they want to hear the same mix that you're hearing, you could just click on the mix right there. So if they're just hearing the same mix, you don't have to set this up. But this way, when you have the talkback mic, you could now just uh, come right over there and have the talkback. And I actually will take the talkback microphone. And if we're doing this a lot, is just have a MIDI foot switch. Turn the talkback on and off so you don't have to always turn it on. And to do that, we could just say, okay, I want to take a MIDI foot switch and we'll go into our generic remote again. And we'll say, you know, this MIDI foot switch message will come over and let's choose, okay, I want to go to VST control room and we'll say talk back. See if it's maybe under command. Okay, so go to control room and then talk back on and off. So that way, every time you hit a foot switch, that could turn the talk back on and off and you could communicate directly with the vocalist. So if you want to have the ability to have a separate mix for the person that's recording versus what you're hearing, then get an audio interface with like four outputs. And uh, if you need it to, and then you could take the second mix of what they're hearing, feed it into a headphone amp, or if your audio interface has two discrete, different independent headphone amplifiers, you could send it out to the second headphone out. If you don't have a second headphone out, you could take outputs three and four into a headphone amp and feed that to the singer. So once you get set up, it's not hard, but once you get it set up, it's a really powerful thing to do. All right, so let's go back to our live questions. Thanks again for all the great questions from everyone. I saw that I, maybe I had a quick question that came in via email. Let me see if I could get that quickly. Okay, so we see this from Michael Pierce. Let me just read through it real quick. It says, uh, I'm working uh, with a client who's already done the first part of his recording elsewhere. We managed uh, to keep the entire project at every stage uh, within either Cubase or Nuendo through uh, great gear and a decent sample rate and bit depth. But for some bizarre reason, he's down sampled to 44.124 bit to do the edits. Uh, I can't change this, but I want to be able to record within those projects at 48K or 96K in a few weeks. I can obviously just bounce stems, convert and import, but I'm also totally not sure I want to trust their edits. So I may want to need to do sample rate uh, conversion to projects themselves. However, I seem to remember uh, that in projects with edits, this can be a dangerous, uh, i.e. you click the wrong button and all the files move uh, around based on your sample position and it all goes weird. Uh, could you demo the correct way to do this and perhaps uh, explain why an alternative way of referencing the tracks based on sample position even exists? Uh, I don't trust myself. I think you've done it before. Uh, so apologies as well. So no problem, Michael. All right, so let's take a look. Okay, so let's look at this project. All right, so let's say we look at our audio files here and we're gonna see that we're at 44.1, 44.1. 
for our sample rate. So let's say I want to take this to 48K or 96, whatever, a different sample rate. So the easiest way to do this is to come over here and let's go to our project menu to project setup. So at this point, we want to choose 48K. Okay, I'm gonna hit okay. And then we'll be prompted to, do we want to convert files to our new sample rate? We'll convert. So it makes sense. Do we want to keep the source files in the pool directory? And this will basically say, are we keeping the original files, the 44.1 files in the pool directory? <coughs> so at this point, we will keep. So we're doing our sample rate conversion. And it says, do you want to keep audio events at their sample positions? So this should probably default to no. So this one is where you want to choose no instead of yes. Um, there, I'm sure someone could come up with a reason why you needed to keep it at the sample positions. Uh, I think for most musical applications, uh, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, so here we're going to choose no. And now that we've done that, we'll have our file kind of playback uh, in the same exact way. I should have played it before. But there's no sample, uh, you know, it's playing back the same exact pitch as it was before. So you want to just choose yes, yes, no. Uh, and you may get a question. So just on the sample positions, always just choose no. And that way, the tempo track data, the automation, your MIDI will all st still be in the same exact position. All right. So thanks for the question, Michael. And never feel bad asking questions have been covered before. So that's why we do these particular things. All right, let me go back to our live questions. All right, so let's just find my spot. Thanks again for all the wonderful questions. And if you want to send questions in advance, you could always send them to clubcubase at steinberg.de. See Sable Winter's uh, lesson so far for today. Shift X plus a West African string instrument called Cora and a new recipe for celery soup. Thanks. All right. All right. So we see Gerald Ely saying the IAC driver trick is a revelation for the day. All right. All right. And we see Best Korean Jesus on the live stream. He's been actively lurking. So that's fine. Glad you stopped in to say hi. You could lurk as long as you hit the like button. So that's the only rule for lurkers. All right, so we see uh, from Jesse Carmichael. Uh, great to see you on the live stream, Jesse. Um, what's the keyboard shortcut name I could search for so I could toggle step and ramp uh, for a point that I select in the MIDI CC editor? So I'm not sure if there is a keyboard shortcut, but let's see if we could find it.
All right, so say we have this and So it might be under, let's look under MIDI. Okay, so let's see if it's, Ah, all right, so look under type of new controller events, uh, toggle step slash ramp. Okay, so I'm going to set a keyboard shortcut for that. Okay, so right now when we come, we'll have this set to step. I'm gonna check my... All right, so I'm gonna do that again. All right, so that's the key command. So Jesse, you go to, uh, and if I'm misunderstanding, let me know, but if you go to key commands under MIDI, And then type of new controller events, toggle, step, slash, ramp. So that's, the I think, the key command you're looking for. And we hope you and your family are doing well, Jesse. Great to hear from you. And thanks for being a part of the live stream. And Jesse's based out of Los Angeles. See, Michael Pierce says, I'm sorry, I've been too loud today. Thank you, Greg. So you haven't been too loud at all, so... Glad that you're a part of the live stream and we appreciate you being here. All right, uh, so just see a question. Hi, I just purchased Cubase yesterday. Congratulations and welcome to the Steinberg community uh, and about to start using it. Which introductory playlist in this channel would you recommend me watching? Thanks. Um, so there's a lot, I think that uh, Dom Segalis just did one a couple weeks ago, like on how to get started in Cubase in 14 minutes. Uh, there's another uh, tutorial video for people just starting out a series. Um, and uh, I forget the gentleman's name, but really good series. Uh, I think it's One Man and His Song, uh, but he has like a whole kind of like, you know, just getting started with Cubase. Um, go to cubaseindex.com and any questions that you have, you know, there's a good chance that we've covered it and, you know, we, we've done over 19,000 different questions at this point on the live streams since the pandemic started and even more before that. But, you know, you could look at Cubase Index and you could just kind of type your question and it will search through all of the live stream topics. Uh, but, you know, there's you know, there's hundreds and hundreds, maybe even over a thousand videos on the Cubase YouTube channel as well. So, all right, and wonderful to see Captain Energy Music on as well. Let's 
So I think my friend, my son has a friend over, sounds like, outside. So sorry if, if it's annoying to listen to. He's having fun. So this last week of va- summer vacation before school starts for him. All right. All right, sorry, my chat field jumped on me. All right, so I see uh, from Sable Winters, I was just trying to recall, it says, um, and this may be about the loop back, uh, and Sable's just saying I'm a PC person, uh, same for that. So if it's with a loop back, I think if you go to loopback.de, it's a freeware utility for uh, for Windows, and it's basically the same thing. So if you just search for a MIDI loop back, and I'm sure that... Uh, Jazz Dude's always really good with the different links. Um, but yeah, I think it's loopback.de. Uh, and that will, if it's with the Sable, if it's with the MIDI loopback, that will work. And uh, it's IAC is just part of the Mac OS, probably going back since uh, since it was, uh, since OS X was released. All right. Okay, so we see uh, from Michael Pierce, uh, thank you, Greg, really weird default choice. Yes, yes, no, nailed it. So, yeah. I'm, I'm sure it makes sense to one person, so. All right, so we see from Audiotopia, appreciate the guidance. Thank you, so you're welcome, and thanks for being part of the live stream. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, I can make a grouping for some events uh, by control plus G. Um, how do I group, uh, how, how to do a group for some notes in editor? Um, all right, so let's take a look. Okay, so if we wanted to just kind of select like a number of notes in, you know, once I have them selected here, we could just, you know, so if I just kind of lasso around the selected notes, I could come here and move those kind of as a group of notes like so. So that would be kind of grouping. And even if I wanted to take those particular notes and say, okay, let's make these all these notes a little longer, we can see that we'll just kind of change the length and we could apply similar kind of group editing functions. All right. Um, so we see how to select notes with same color. All right, so it could really depend on uh, if we have how the colors are set up, so let's say if
we just create different scenarios here. So let's say I copy this and I want this color to be red and this one green. So if I'm looking at multiple events within a single edit screen, so I will come here and we open the key editor, we could look at the color scheme for events. So we, the default color scheme will be <clears throat> velocity. But let's say if I wanted to see color scheme based on pitch, each pitch would have a different color. Uh, each channel can have a different color, but let's say I want to look at by part. So here we could see that we will have, and let me just change this part down. Uh, two octaves so we can see it. Okay, so now when we look at both of these events, it'll be they're not going to be stacked on top of each other. So uh, as we want to do this, we'll just come over to our key editor and we can see um, so when we have parts, we can now, you know, select the individual parts. So if I wanted to click on, uh, to make this the active voice, we could click on it and that will make it like that will switch between the two active voices. So this way, once we have, you know, this voice, if I select this, we could just switch to that particular color. Uh, and then we could also just kind of switch here and there's keyboard shortcuts that you could assign for this functionality as well to switch which one is active or not. Okay, so we see Spike Williams has to dash and that he learned a lot. So thanks for joining us and great to see you on the live stream. Uh, so we have a question. Uh, can I use the Cubase reverb and delay plugins on mic in real time to do Facebook live? Uh, so yeah, you can, you know, so it could depend on how you're getting the audio out. Uh, so sometimes, you know, if you're setting it up in a loopback or if you just have like, you know, the audio that's being generated in real time, and you're transmitting that you could you could definitely use those plugins. Uh, the reverb plugins you know may impose a little bit of latency, so just be aware of that. But you could definitely use it. All right, so we see Harry Hem just saying good day. So thanks for being part. And we have uh, Didier Glorio. Uh, I'm sure I pronounced that wrong. Uh, hi guys, uh, it was too late, just came home. So you're still, we're still going, so no problems. Any questions you have, just feel free to ask. Okay, just okay. So we have a question. Um, since my new installation of Cubase Pro 11 on a brand new PC, I always get this when I start Cubase. All my WAV files are on external drive. Nothing changed, but every time I get this warning, uh, when Media Bay attempted to mount the volume database on drive E, duplicate entries were found. Uh, how should this be resolved? Uh, if I choose don't mount volume database or delete volume database entries, every new startup is the same. Any idea what I can do to solve this? Um, so check if it's if you have duplicate entries, like maybe if you copied from one drive to a secondary drive and try going to in Media Bay. Um, and if you notice that you have like on this computer where you have, you know, on 
uh, let's say, you know, you go to this hard drive and then if you have another hard drive connected, um, so let's say I have a, like a little portable drive, like a, a Lacey drive or a Lacy drive. Um, so at this point, if you have it, On, you know, if you don't want it to be recognized in Media Bay, try to just uncheck. Um, and then you can say, I don't want Media Bay to look into this drive, but I want it to look into this drive. So again, just go to Media Menu to Media Bay and go under this computer and look at your two drives and figure out which one you want it to look at, which one you don't want it to look at and then uncheck the one that you don't want it to look at and see if that helps. So let me know if that's helpful. Okay, so we see uh, Stephen McCormick asks, uh, just upgraded to 12 and noticed that Prologue and Mystic weren't working, saw some release notes about them. Are they coming back? Thanks. So the company that we did those plugins with, uh, they're no longer supporting it and they aren't going to be able to make it compatible with future operating systems or current processors. Like for instance, on the Mac platform, they're not going to be uh, M1 native uh, probably ever. So they would have to be completely redesigned and recoded. So that's why they were discontinued in version 11. Uh, and if you're a Windows user, that may seem a bit annoying that it's discontinued because, you know, perhaps a Mac issue. Uh, but if you Google, you could probably find a way of maybe copying over a certain DLL file and have uh, functionality where they're still working. It's, I don't think, officially supported, but lots of people have been doing it. So and if you wanted that for compatibility with uh, previous, uh, you know, previous projects, you could do, you could try and experiment with that. All right. So we have, uh, Robert RJ Jansen says, thanks. I'm new. Also got software with the Yamaha AGO six Mark two from Sweetwater. Thanks for being a part. And we're glad that you're a Sweetwater customer and the Yamaha as well. So and let us know any questions you have. And we do this every Tuesday and Friday. All right, so we have uh, from Loading Soon, it says, Hi, Greg, uh, question. When we recording a vocal on a single track, let's say the singer have four bars, he did a mistake on the second bar, how can I record on the same track, just that bar at that same track? All right, so we call this like a punch in. So let's say, um, so let's say I have this particular track going on here. I'll, I'll just do it with the vocal file real quick. Okay, so let's say we're. All right, so let's say we had our singer kind of blow a line and we want to do, you know, what was often in the old days called a punch in. We're going to kind of just punch in to record just a small section and then uh, just overdub that. So the easiest way, let's listen to our vocal here. It was seventh grade in the school. So let's say we just want to get waiting on our right here. So we just, the singer totally botched this phrase. So what I'm going to do is just grab the range selection tool. And then uh, we could hit like the JK to turn off the snap if it's not going to snap. And then I have just a quick, uh, where this is going to set the left and right locators automatically. I have that as a preference, but... Uh, if you don't, just select the range and then hit the letter P, like in Paul. 
And then we see right here, we have I and O. So this will be punch in, punch out. So you hit I for punch in, O for punch out. So now as we rewind, we will play. We're gonna arm, we're gonna have this track selected. When we play. So I will record enable this particular track. And I'll make sure that I have an actual input defined here, so. So, and I have that set on like a loop. And if I wanted to not loop that, I would just turn off my cycle. So we set the range with the actual range tool. And this is, you know, and this is an easy way of just like taking one word. And as we want to just kind of punch right in, I'll just, we'll see that we record enable this. And then we don't have to do anything. So it will just automatically punch in, start recording right at that left locator point, and then it will stop recording right at that point, and it will just lay it over top, just like that. So again, if we watch this process, we want to uh, just hit I and O here. So punch in, punch out, and then record enable the track. It was seventh grade. And automatically, it'll just punch in directly in that particular region. So in the old days, you would have to, you know, on a tape machine, have to physically figure out kind of how long the punch in would take and kind of hit it slightly ahead to get the punch. But we can get incredibly precise with Cubase just on doing punches. So try just that punch in uh, loading soon and let me know how that works out for you. Okay, so we see uh, Loop MIDI for Windows is what people are using for doing loopbacks on the Windows platform. Okay. All right, so just, all right, just reading through comments. So thanks for all the great questions. Okay, so we see, uh, hi Greg, uh, Cubase 12 Windows on my right pane media tab. All my sample folders are visible, but some of the samples are not. Uh, any ideas why, please? They're all on the same hard drive. All right, so let's come over here and we'll just go to the media. Okay, so when we I guess if we're going to the file browser and we want to look at particular folders. So I will select this folder. Now, sometimes you may come over here and you know, you like, let's say if we go to the audio folder, like we say, Oh, there should be audio files in there, but there is, a kind of a search criteria here. So I'm going to just kind of get rid of that. And now we see all of the, you know, potential media bay files and also check, you know, like the files of type. So, you know, come to the file browser and make sure that you don't have any kind of search criteria at the top here. And sometimes you may also, like if we're looking at different folders here, 
you know, we may have, we could just kind of set this and you may have like a condition, like I'm looking for a, you know, heavy metal accordion in six, eight. So you could have different filters that will also be assigned here. So make sure you don't have any filters or anything in the search field. And that should show you kind of all the content that's in that particular folder. All right, great to see Mitch Michelle from uh, Michigan. Thanks for being part of the live stream today. All right, see some discussion of Blade Runner. All right. See Sable Winters likes auto magically. All right. All right, so we have that base uh, just uh, saying hi from Teal from Tacoma, Washington. So I miss going to Seattle and Pacific Northwest. Beautiful area of the world and country. All right, so I think I'm caught up with all the questions. Let's see if there's more questions that come in or if I've missed a question from someone. Um, let me, yeah, just feel free to enter it in the chat field. We'll give it a couple minutes here. And we got through a lot of different topics today. So, all right, just checking some of my chat area here. All right, so we have a question. Uh, when uh, we recording s symbols and slow BPM. Is it possible to speed up the whole project by BPM or scale just to let the drummer do a better performance recording symbols and bring it back to normal? So, yeah. Okay, so let's say we have uh, this project and I'll just revert it. Okay, so let's say uh, our project here is set, uh, our tempo is like 100 beats per minute. So let's say as we're listening to it here, we could select all of the audio events And if they're in musical mode, which we could turn on and off here, I could now slow down my tempo from 100, let's say to 80. And then we could record a new audio track. So as we record, let's say the symbol part. Okay, so now what we want to do is we go to our pool window and we'll say our test file here is set to the tempo where the other ones are set to 100 beats per minute. This one is set to 80 beats a minute. So I can now place this track into musical mode. And as we would play, so I go back to 100. The cymbal is recorded at a slower tempo at 
uh, 80 beats a minute will now just automatically fit into the current tempo of 80 beats a minute. So you could slow down, record, and just place that into musical mode, and it's going to capture the tempo that was recorded, and then you could just simply speed up and adjust the tempo afterwards. Um, all right, so we see, hello, what is the best reverb to be used in a, to a voiceover, a very simple one? So a lot of times, you know, for, you know, for voiceovers, a lot of times, you know, reverb isn't used, uh, you know, unless it's like, you know, often you hear it for like a dream sequence, but, you know, often for dialogue or, you know, uh, like a podcast, you know, generally reverb isn't used. Uh, one, you know, I think kind of the LA studio, the one that comes to kind of the default one that opens up with, uh, with reverence is is a nice kind of subtle reverb so let me just go to i'll do a new project here and i'll just import like a voice file All right, so say we just have gray colored woods cover the large part of the surface. So if I had to add a reverb, let's come over here and say just typical kind of voiceover stuff. Um, you know, I may put just a, you know, I think that the built in default reverence preset, but again, a lot of times you may not have a lot of reverb on voiceover stuff. Yes. This even tent was indeed broken up by streaks of yellow sand break in the lower lands. So if and you go like a lot, but if you just want to put family out topping the others, some singly, some in clumps, but the general coloring was uniform and sad. So without the hills ran up clear above the vegetation and spires of naked rock. They were strangely shaped, and the spyglass, which was by three or four hundred feet the tallest on the island. Was and then if you want to take like the high frequencies, you could just kind of EQ. Running up sheer from almost every side, then suddenly cut off the So top. that would be a pretty good choice if I had to put a reverb on a voiceover track, so. All right, uh, so we see, um, so from Sable Winters, uh, can we talk sometime about best track naming conventions uh, in an orchestration? You know, so generally, you know, there could be very traditional, you know, like, uh, you know, there's, you know, a definite order. So often it's going to start, you know, uh, like flute, oboe, clarinet, you know, there's kind of the typical order of flute, oboe, clarinet. You could have bassoon, you know, maybe uh, alto clarinet, bass clarinet, you know, for winds and then brass, percussion, and then strings is generally kind of the order. So like for strings, it would be, you know, violin one, two, viola, celli, bass. You'd have uh, on to brass, uh, trumpet, uh, French horn, trombone, tuba so but you know sometimes composers will have naming conventions where they'll have all their tuba sounds together all their trombone sounds together or they may organize it by library so maybe iconica horns and then those you know and then long short notes or sforzandos um but if you could let us know maybe uh, you know so there's kind of traditional orchestration that when you print it out and what a composer 
or what a conductor wants to see in the order that's kind of a, a you know a known entity so you could set up templates for that but you know often what is being created from you know from the midi to the scores you know you may have multiple parts making up uh, within the template making uh, you know, a violin sound may be coming from six or seven different instrument tracks. So, um, so those naming conventions could be different, but often it'll be like, you know, flutes long, flute short, violins, you know, bowed long, bowed short, you know, stuff like that, or different attacks. So. Uh, so we see a uh, question, uh, when exporting, is there a way for the exported track to appear under the track you exported? It always ends up at the bottom of the session. So when you do an export audio mix down, it will end up at uh, the bottom of the session. If you're doing a render in place, um, so let's say I wanted to take um, these events here. All right, so say I just I'll just take these events. So I want to take all these drums, and if I go to to edit menu to render in place, and we go to render settings, I'll say okay, let's keep our channel settings, and we'll do this. And now when we render, it's going to render all. Sorry about that. Let me just mix it down. So when I go to render in place this time, I'll do it correctly. So we'll say, okay, I'm going to, uh, did it again. Sorry. Okay. So this time I'll try not to make a mistake three times in a row. We'll go to our render settings and I'll just choose channel. And then here we could just choose mix down to one audio file and we could include all the different signal processing. And now when we do that, everything's going to be rendered to uh, mix down to one file underneath the last selected track. So if you have the option to do render in place instead of an export audio mix down, you could do it just like that. And you could select multiple uh, events. All right. So wonderful to see Matt Elston from London. This is saying best wishes to everyone. All right, so we have a question. Uh, is there a way to make the track height change size with shortcuts? Um, all right, so I think if we just, uh, like the up down arrow while holding down uh, the shift key. So the nope, wrong one, so control or command. So if I want to extend the, uh, the bottom, so let me just hide. So if I have this track selected, so uh, control or command plus the up arrows, I'm just moving the down arrows here to resize. So this way we could just uh, make it smaller, Just and this is almost like grabbing the bottom. So I could take the bottom up of the height or the bottom down, down arrow, control slash command, up arrow just like that. All right, so we have a question. Uh, is there a way to make the faders in the mix control show pre-metering? I guess like pre-fader. So all you have to do is right click in the fader in the meter area and then we'll go to global meter settings and we'll see meter position and then we could just choose input so you could also have a uh, post fader or post panner so you could just click on input there so try that
All right, so we have Tiago checking in from Brazil. Thanks for being there. All right, so we see a uh, question, uh, how to calibrate the stereo out signal for everything? Uh, and is there, okay, um, sorry, just had an email block the question. Uh, how to calibrate stereo out for everything? And is there any possibility to calibrate each signal out separately, like different headphones and speakers? You know, so ideally you want a, you know, a room that translates, uh, but, you know, not everyone has the budget to do that. So within Cubase, there isn't necessarily like a calibration mode. There are some tools like Sonarworks a lot of people use, um, you know, and there's a couple like room correction, uh, I think IK Media Arc, IK Multimedia's Arc is also another one that people use. So, and that will just kind of, you know, listen to a monitored signal of your room from your metering position and adjust, you know, whether those things are accurate or not, or they're just different, um, you know, it's, it's hard to know. Uh, and there's, um, in Nuendo, when we're working with, uh, you know, when we're doing binaural mixing for Dolby Atmos mixing, Nuendo will have a headphone match plugin that will work to, you know, make, you know, the different calibrations for headphones for, you know, when you're doing spherical, like 360 degree at most projects, but nothing in Cubase specifically for that. All right, so we have a question about the track height, uh, but is there a way to change all track heights at once? Okay, so all you have to do is, while well, we change the track height of one track, is just to hold down the control or command key, and then we could change the track height for all tracks like that. So just grab at the bottom, and while holding control on Windows or Command on Mac, you could just move it down, move it up, and all the tracks will be resized accordingly. All right, so we see Soren, uh's question. Um, I do mix downs of my low volume mixes and I want them normalized to minus 14 luffs after the export or before the export or in some way simple. Right now I export then using Audacity. So it's really easy. So let's say, okay, I'll do uh, an export audio mix down So let's say I'll do an export audio mix down here, All right? And we'll just call it I'll just quickly put this to the desktop so I could throw it away. Okay, so I'm going to send this to my desktop and in the end what I want to do is I'm just gonna say let's create an audio track. So we'll do a quick export audio mix down. It's gonna add a new audio track. And then all we have to do to this particular audio track is select it, go to your audio to processes and we'll choose normalize. And then we could click on the loudness units here and we'll say minus 14. And that will now normalize the audio to minus 14 luffs for you, just like that. So you don't have to go out to Audacity or a different program. You could do it just uh, inside of WaveLab or directly inside of Cubase.
All right. So let's see if we might be at the end of questions again. Thanks for all the great questions. We'll see if there's any more that kind of sneak in. Okay, so we see a uh, question. Is there a way to make uh, multiple sends mimic the relative gain between the tracks? All right, so let's see if I understand this. Let me just revert. Okay, so let's say on my drums, if I have a bunch, so I think maybe if we want to keep the gains relative. Okay, so let's say if I come here and I'm going to add like an effect send to all of my tracks. Okay, so we'll just add an effects channel. Okay, we're going to have our reverb. And let's say we come over here and we'll have varying amounts of the reverb on different tracks. Okay, so if I have like all these tracks selected and enable Q-Link, um, I could adjust all of these proportionally. So if I wanted to increase or decrease the sends, We could do it there and that will keep it proportional between all of the different ones. And if I want it to be the exact same, I would just click on absolute and that would put it to the same value for all of them. So I could just come over here and adjust the relative sends. So if I want to increase the gain, but still keep the same proportionality, enable Q-Link and select the channels and then adjust. All right, so we have Diamond District Studios tuning in from uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. Thank you for being a part of the live stream. All right, so we'll see if there's any more questions that sneak in. I want to thank everyone for all the great questions. I hope that everyone has learned new things. All right, so we see um, you did answer everything. We appreciate it a lot. Uh, my last question for today is, is there any configuration available to see uh, RMS level with the peaks on the mix console faders? You know, so when we look at just kind of like the faders here, we could see, you know, it's, we could kind of see more of the peaks when we look at our So we see more of the peaks like when we look at our main meter or even when we open up something like Supervision. So here you could, you know, on Supervision, take a look at every single function for your peaks and meters and where they're changing colors, but the faders here will kind of be the same and it's often kind of more critical at the main mixer, at the main uh, summing part of the mixer for stuff like that. All right, so we see, um, it says these live streams are awesome, by the way, so many questions answered. Huh? Yeah, so we can go through a lot of questions and we try to help people out. So, right, it's a deep program. We want people to all be power Cubase users. All 
All right, so we see uh, my question is around applying offline effects to events like Waves NS noise reduction plugin. How would I go about that and preview in real time? Um, all right, so let's say if we have a plugin. All right. All right, so let's say I want to put like on this base. And I want to put just a, we'll put just kind of a flanger or something obnoxious on it. So if I have it there, you know, if I want it to just freeze the track, I could just go to, you know, render in place and I could render the particular channel setting. So I could just say, okay, well, let's render it right here. So we could preview it in real time if you wanted to. Um, if you wanted to, so now this track has none and this is rendered with that we could choose to get rid of the original file if you wanted to another way of doing this is if we go to our direct offline processing um i could just kind of take this flanger so let's say i have this event selected here uh, i'm going to take this flanger and drag it over and then you know i could preview the event of what it sounds like here. So we have some silence at the beginning. Um, or we could just auto apply. So if we know what it sounds like from. So if I just click on auto apply, it's then just rendered that particular file to it. So you could preview in a direct offline processing and make adjustments as well. So there's a couple of different ways of doing that. So and again, you could open up the offline processing by hitting F7. And then at any time, you could just come over here. And if you did like six processes, you could just say, oh, I just want to delete process number three, and keep one, two, four, five, six, seven. All right, uh, wonderful to see David Ruder and Kristen Parisi on the live stream. So I, I really enjoyed seeing all your pictures uh, of Canada uh, with your family, David, on Facebook. Beautiful pictures. Thanks for sharing those. All right, uh, so we have question number two. I'm using a MacBook Pro laptop. My CPU usage gets too crazy too quickly when mixing. How can I get around this? Uh, mixing no more than 30 tracks. So, you know, realize that sometimes, you know, how audio engines will work if you have 16 plugins on one track, you know, that could only be utilizing one particular CPU core. So, depending on how most plugins are written, uh, but I'll just open up kind of a big project here on my Mac and let's just take a look. And this is an M1. I uh, just got this last week. So let me just. So, you know, first thing I would do is obviously raise the buffer size of your audio interface and see, but let's say I'm just running, uh, we'll just go open up. And this is a lot of VST instruments all kind of going on at once, so. So all together, this would be 
great project by Clay Oswald, who's on one of our live streams recently. So this is about 120 tracks all in with all the effects and automation and virtual instruments. And that's my performance here. You can see there's lots of activity going on here. So it's probably like 12 or 15 stacked vocals. So, you know, check to raise your buffer is the first thing I would do. And then, you know, try freezing tracks. But a lot of those things, um, you know, <clears throat> and if you have like, you know, one huge plug-in chain rise that that's probably utilizing one CPU core and can make your whole computer seem like it's actually uh, not, you know, not performing as you would expect. Okay, so we see, um, <clears throat> excuse me, question. Um, doo -doo -doo. Okay, so we see, uh, hey there, I'm new to Cubase and was wondering how to pitch shift both an instrument track and an audio track. You know, so one of the great things you could do is use a, um, you know, just use the, we have a track called a transpose track, and this could work for both MIDI and audio globally. So let's say I wanted to go to this project. Okay, so let's say we're... Do you recall the day we first met? That was a long, long... All right, and I'll just get this back to our for status. Okay, so I'm gonna add a transpose track. Do you recall the day we first met? That was a long, long so if you wanna try different keys. It was seventh grade in the school parking. And let me just I'll move my transpose track up. Do you recall the day we first met? That was a long, long time. So now I can just say I want to go up a whole step. It was seventh grade in the school parking lot. Modulated up a whole step. So, sorry, just hit the wrong button. But so, say we start off in our tonic key. It was seventh grade in the school parking lot. Both MIDI and audio. Then we went down. We returned to our home key. So experiment with the transpose key. So the transposition track, sorry. All right, so we have a question. Um, what are the very best settings for optimal performance without sacrificing sound quality inside and outside Cubase? Windows user here, though. So no problems. I use Windows in my studio. Uh, you know, first thing is when you go to your studio setup, you know, make sure like your video card driver isn't working against you. In a Windows platform, there's a tool called DPC Latency Checker. 
and that could point out um, if you have uh, you know, if you have different components of your computer that are going to be causing, uh, interrupts, you know, or disruptions for real time audio performance, I think it's resplendence, uh, and look for DPC latency monitor. I know jazz dude's always so good at putting a link in, but that could find out, you know, different stuff. And when you go to your, uh, audio system, make sure you go to the advanced setup. Uh, you know, you want to make sure multi-processing is activated as your guard is on and you'll see on a windows platform, something that says use Steinberg, uh, you know, power scheme. So use that in, cause a lot of times computers to be eco friendly or more green in nature to be more energy efficient, will slow down the processors. Um, so those are some of the things that you could check, but you know, for, you know, usually the default settings work really well, but just make sure you don't have, um, you know, different, uh, you know, interrupts that are being caused by different components. So, All right, so we see from uh, Jose Antonio, just uh, was thinking of putting tape saturation on every track, but no idea if it would actually feel different. So, you know, you could always try it, but you know, it, it's it's no problem. You could definitely work with that. So like if I wanted to do it on all of the audio for this project, you know, I could just come over here. Again, let's say, okay, while we're playing. Well, I remember the day that we went. I'll just turn on quick link. And our first kiss, there was no regret. Right after that Garfield show. You told your daddy and called my mom. So we'll come over here. For any boy that say, okay, I want quadrifuzz and all the tracks. Or if we want to put on Magneto too. So you can do whatever you want to get different sounds. So, and the channel strip is, you know, and there's a, you know, when you go to Cubase, one of the great things is on every single track, when you come to the uh, channel strip, you could just come right over here and you have saturation. So you could just put it on every single track right here in the built-in channel strip. See, Michael Pierce has a great comment about the mobile fidelity record story. So, yeah, I thought that was really interesting as well. All the guys are irritated that they use digital. So, Okay, so just reading through comments. All right, so we see a question. Uh, how to copy multiple automation information from one existing audio track to another new audio track which has no automation information yet without copy and paste one by one? All right. Okay, so let's say... On this one, we have no automation. And let's say, okay, I wanted to do volume. And let's do OK, 
Okay, so we'll have just a couple. We'll add one more. Okay, so let's see if we can do this in the project logical editor. All right, so we're gonna say, let's select all automation on selected track. Okay, so let's see if this, all right, we may have to, Parent object is selected, so let's see if we. All right, so we'll just see if this works. So what I'm telling it to do is, all right, so we have automation here and I want to take this automation, select the automation, and then maybe move down and paste at origin. So let's see if this works. Let's give us a try one more time. So I may have to play around with it a little more. Um, but I think you could also You know, duplicate the track without events. So let's see, I think this is a built-in pre, a built-in macro as well. So depending on your scenario, uh, duplicate selected tracks without data. So let's see if that didn't copy over the automation. So um, I could play with it a little more if you want to email me. You know, I know we're running kind of short on time. But if you want to email me, Tiago at uh, clubcubase at steinberg.de. All right. All right. We see Michael Pierce has to check out. It's getting late in the UK. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for all your questions. All right. Um, all right. So I see that's brilliant. Thank you. Uh, is track transposition possible in Cubase LE Elements 10? So I don't. Uh, have a current version installed, but you could check it out. If not, another thing to do is just to select all of the events and you could probably just see, uh, like if you have multiple events selected, like here, you could just see a transpose indication here and you could transpose right there from the uh, info line as well.
All right, so you see a uh, question, how many speakers do I need for basic Atmos and what position? So generally you're gonna have a 714. Uh, so not everyone does that where you're gonna have like left, right, uh, center, LFE, left surround, right surround, left side, right side, and then uh, the point four, uh, like the point one is the LFE and the point four is like, you know, front, uh, front height and rear height. Uh, but a lot of people will just do binaural mixing because that's how most people are going to be listening to it. So sometimes you could just get by with headphones, but ideally you'd want to have 12 speakers. All right, so we see, uh, do, you, um, do you happen to know uh, routing features are programs like folders who act as group tracks? So, you know, you could do this pretty easily with the macro that's already kind of built in. So if you haven't done this, so let's say uh, I wanted to take, um, So I'll take these, I'm currently in a folder, but if we go to edit to macros, you could just say, and your macro list will be much smaller than mine. Um, but you say selected tracks to new folder and add group channel. So I'll just click on name it drums. And then it's created a folder track and already named it and created the name for the folder and did all the routing for you. So just do that because our folders can contain more elements than just audio. So it could be a video track. It could be, you know, transposition track, chord tracks. All right. So with that, we're just about out of time. I want to thank everyone for all the great questions. We'll be back on Friday starting at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern. Uh, thanks for all the wonderful questions. And if you learned something, make sure you do hit the like button and I appreciate everyone being involved with the live stream. So thank you very much. And we will see everyone again on Friday. Take care.